Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Broken by Concept. Uh, today, we've got a special episode for 154. We've got Expetu, the Shen God with us today. Thank you for taking the time today to uh, have a chat to us. Um, so feel free to introduce yourself, Expetu. Um, who are you? People, a lot of people watching this probably already know you've seen you on YouTube somewhere, but give us a brief introduction. Uh, so greetings, I'm uh, Axe Petu, uh, Petu, also known as Petu the Beast back in the day, but uh, I don't go by that name anymore. And I'm a Shen player, uh, I like building weird stuff on Shen and discovering new strategies, and then I make some homemade YouTube videos about my League of Legends technology. <laughs> that's, that's who I am. <laughs> awesome. So, you know, where I wanted to start, you know, a lot of people in our audience, um, you know, we get questions all the time such as, you know, oh, I don't know if I should be a one trick or I don't know how to choose my champion, champion pool, question X, Y, Z. People lose their minds over yeah. champion pool in League of Legends. I'm sure you hear that all the time. <laughs> Biggest thing, you know, well, should I play this champ thing? And then meta like this, meta that. I shouldn't stop. I shouldn't should stop playing this champ because it's not meta, et cetera. So, you know, for yeah. you, you're a long-term Shen player, you know, and I actually checked out YouTube. Yeah. You've been doing Shen content on YouTube for like six years. Uh, which is yeah. incredibly impressive. So I, I'm a bit obsessed with the champion. <laughs> yeah, well, you yeah, definitely can sh see that through your content. So, um, so why Shen? Walk us through how how did you get into picking Shen, and did you pick Shen knowing that you'd be kind of wanted to be a, a, a kind of like a one trick, or walk us through that whole process for you? Uh, okay, I can I can go into the history. So so it was. Shen got reworked, it was 2016, I think February, and um, I was, back then, I was a uh, Lee Sin and Kragas main, so I was playing jungle mostly. My favorite role. And, yeah, yeah, I, I, I was really big on the Lee Sin, like, I, I was in high school back then, and uh, my, like, number one priority was to make a cool insect place on Lee Sin. And then I was always submitting that to them to like different uh, YouTube channels because they had like back then league community. It was not so much like full gameplay, not so much like highlights uh, or like like uh, game highlights. It was more about these montages and everything. So people were making like uh, Masters of Lee Sin montage and uh, Riven OTP montage and all this sort of stuff. So I thought that was the coolest thing ever. So I was I was doing that on Lee Sin, and then I actually got featured in one of these like. Uh, very big montage channels back then for my leasing gameplay, but then I I kind of I kind of wanted to try something new, and the Shen got reworked. So I thought, okay, this is perfect because no one else knows how to play it, so I'm gonna figure it out. And I started it as kind of a off roll type of thing. So if I got got top lane instead of jungle, uh, I would just pick Shen and play Shen top lane. Uh, but then soon, like maybe after 20 games, I realized that, okay, I'm sitting at 51% win rate leasing at Diamond 4, and I've played this new champion for 20 games, and I have 80% win rate. Hmm. Uh, maybe maybe it's time to, <laughs> time to change the kind of main, because uh, I don't think the leasing was working out that well, even though I really liked playing it, but Chen was like more influential in the games. And then I kept on playing him. I didn't start like one tricking Shen uh, for the season six uh, because I still still kept playing jungle mostly. Uh, but when the preseason came, it was preseason seven, and back then the season actually started very early. So it was like the actual season started at December already. I think it was like the twentieth of December or something. And then I was like, okay, well. I will just pick my highest win rate champion, which currently is Shen, and I will only play him for, let's say, 50 games, and we'll see what ELO we get. Uh, mind you, I was master tier peak at that time, and within two weeks, uh, this was Nordic East, so it's not impressive yet, but within two weeks, I had reached Challenger by playing only Shen, and I was like, okay, 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 maybe we focus on this, this is like <laughs> what I'm good at. Yeah, <laughs> and then uh, like I kept playing that, and during the same season, so the first season that I got challenger on Nordic East, I then got like rank three challenger as well at the end of the season. I was up there in one thousand LP, but at the same time, I was stuck in Diamond Two on Europe West. So I was playing on both servers because I started on Nordic East, 
I was playing on Europe West on a Smurf account and I could not get past Diamond 2. So then the next next uh, kind of problem to solve was how to get uh, into high law on Europe West. But we can go into that later. But yeah, that's how I got started on Shen. Wow. And it was not like a deliberate choice, I guess. It was more like, okay, this, this champion works well. Let's do more. This actually ties into your philosophy, Nathan, where you're a massive advocate of picking the champ that you're best at playing that champ as much as you can because it gets you to a high elo bracket and then coincidentally when you win more in league you kind of have more fun and that gets you curious more curious about the game and you actually learn more about the game coincidentally because you're more motivated to i guess learn in a way like you've kind of been more of a fan of okay i've got this champ at a you know i'm not really that good at it but on this champ, I'm yeah. doing really well. But even though I don't like it as much, you're on the side of yeah. playing the champ that you're better at, right? Yeah, like using Expetu's journey saying, you know, he, he visioned himself as a jungler, right? Yeah. At least in Gragas player. But he was like, okay, well, this is working on the side. I never envisioned myself to yeah. be a Shen player, but I'm just getting results. And yeah, winning in the league is fun. And like, it just is, you know, as much as we talk yeah. about it, it through really the process, <laughs> it's just like, you know, just go for it. So that's, I, I love that. I, I, th- I yeah, love that I think story. that's such a real story. That's exactly, I mean, it's no bullshit. That's exactly how it is. Sometimes people just click with certain sort of style and stuff. But, yeah. but you know, it's interesting though, because tanks have a very negative view in League of Legends solo queue, expect to. So did you like see Shen and be like, okay, I'm not going to, you can't play, you can't carry with tanks in solo queue. Like what's, why pick a tank as a, as a champion to, to main? Especially <laughs> coming from Lee Sin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you have to understand, uh, like I was, I was, I was what, 16 at the time. And all I'm thinking is, okay, Lee Sin, this guy is a monk. He's doing freaking backflips and kicks. This is cool. <laughs> And then, then uh, Gragas was just like a backup pick because Lee Sin was banned and it can, you can do Gragas Insect as well with the E ultimate. So it was just like a substitute for Lee Sin. And then I go, oh, Shen, the guy has two swords. He's a ninja. He's cutting people down. Okay, this is cool as hell. Let's go play it. So I'm not, I'm not thinking like, okay, uh, it's a tank. I shouldn't play tanks. I need to play 1v9 Irelia carry. I was thinking more like, oh, it's a cool champion. Oh, cool. Interesting. Yeah, it's literally just, it's just as simple as that champ's cool. Yeah, you just you like know? it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love yeah. that. And so and do I think you... it's, a, it's, a, it's like an overlooked part because be, I feel like content creators forget that like there is this si- side to the champions that they are actually like thematic and there's like visuals and it's about like, for example, I really like Lilia's gameplay. Like, I really love how Lilia plays, but I hate the aesthetic. Like mm. I don't, I don't want to play a Disney deer, so I'm not gonna play Lilia. And I, I don't know, it's maybe like, maybe, maybe for pro players this is not a factor at all. They only think about the gameplay. But for me, it's also about how like it feels and what's the fantasy. Because I think, like, I actually read this book on video game design called Art of Game Design. It's really, it's not only on video games but in games general. And one of the kind of topics was like, what is the purpose of the game? And most of the time, the purpose of the game is to give an experience. And most of the time, it's like fulfilling some kind of fantasy. So here, like the fantasy is to be this dual wielding ninja who controls everything and beats opponents down. And I think that's what what you can do by playing Shen. We've used before the we like because we like Formula One a lot on the podcast. Yeah. Um, and we like to use the analogy of like becoming one with the car. We I think it was from one, one of Michael yeah. Shoemaker's documentaries, yeah. and becoming like one with the champion. I think like really enjoying the champion's aesthetic, as you said, yeah. helps you feel like you're that ninja assassin, right? You're like that ninja, like you know, because mm. then you, it's just it sounds corny, isn't it? A bit well, corny, I think it's but... an extension of our personality. I've always been a massive believer in like the champ you choose, or at least the style you choose, is a is an extension of you you as a person, right? Like for example, I've had many of clients that I've worked with that they're a more, a more passive support oriented like type, type person and they're drawn to the Seraphines or, you know, whatever mm. those Lux or whatever might be more passive supportive type style. Whereas the people that are a little bit more, in, I guess, uh, proactive in their approach and everything want to get in the action and they want the game to revolve around them in a way. Right. But I, I totally, yeah. I, I'm really glad you said that as well, expert too, because I, if I'm brutally honest with myself, when I first started playing league, I remember to this day, this is, this is going to sound like the most ridiculous story ever, by <laughs> the way. Go. I was, I, I don't know why I think I don't know if I didn't have my phone or it wasn't, I know I didn't have internet on my phone and I was, <laughs> I wanted to search a mobifier guide for Malzahar and because yeah, my, it's like, I wouldn't, yeah, I didn't have data on my phone. So 
the my dad had a Kindle, and on the Kindle it had free internet, and I literally searched Movifier on a Kindle, and was reading a Malzahar guide. And I was I remember obsessed. I was obsessed with the aesthetics of Malzahar. I just loved some like that. dark mage. It was just so cool. I've always loved mages. Yeah, and I just wanted to play Malzahar. That's all I was thinking about. This is not because he was good or what his abilities did it was just the feel of him the, the aesthetic element of him and i just loved mages and that's like kind of went down that huge rabbit hole of playing a lot of mages i just lo- was drawn to mages and even in other games in all of my mmos and stuff i loved mages and really yeah. you're spot on expert to when when a lot of us play games for the first time we're very pure and especially when we're younger we don't really think mm. about this shit it, we feel it don't we we just we, we just kind of subconsciously choose what we oh, just yeah i have a really good story on this actually <laughs> Yeah, sure, man. Uh, that reminded me of, yeah. Uh, um, so I started playing League because of my um, younger brother. He He's two years younger than me. And he he introduced me to League. He was like, okay, I, I had this really cool game. Uh, I think he was watching like a Zack Champion Spotlight or something when Zack came out in season three. And I was like uh, 14, 13 years old at the time. And then uh, my brother was telling me like, oh yeah, it's this cool game and there's there's these monsters and and you can kill them and there's the different champions that you can pick. I was like, okay, okay, maybe I'll have to try it. I, I remember my first game, uh, my brother was like coaching me behind me and I could not remember where the red buff was. So I was asking him like, there was this lizard family somewhere. There was a lizard family, <laughs> there is a lizard family. I didn't have like any clue about how the map worked. And then he had to like click the mouse for me to go, go <laughs> take me to the lizard family to get the red buff. Uh, and then like just to get you in that kind of mindset where we were and then when we were not at home we couldn't play league so we were at our uh, summer cottage it's in, in Finland it's very common that you kind of spend the summer in like a different place so it's mm. like a, you touch a grass kind of yeah yeah you touch grass yeah so all we were doing there we had a trampoline and we were like talking about which champion we want to buy next with our influence points and we were like mimicking the champions so we were like on the trampoline and when i was doing like leasing dragon's rage kicks <laughs> like on the trampoline that that's what i remember so it's very much like about the feeling of yeah the game. and the, maybe it's just because i was younger back then but i think this is like still the reason why i'm drawn to league is because it kind of links me with those feelings yeah for sure now i just think of like expect to like running around his house as a kid as like a ninja like Shen. assassin or something like doing like the naruto <laughs> <Yeah. run. laughs> that's like the next level going to the owning you know owning your identity yeah. becoming one with the champion no, but i think that's so important because you know at the end of the day you know you know fun having fun with your champion it cuts through all the shit like it cuts through the fat. Like, uh, like if you peel all the layers of like, you know, you know, people talk about uh, riots, this leagues, shuts a shit game, <laughs> toxic this. Like, if you're just having fun with your champion, like it cuts through yeah. so much. It's such a powerful emotion that of like genuine fun and and like enjoyment of playing a champion. You know, it's mm. such a wholesome emotion. I want to yeah. ask this yeah. now, expert you. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm on, under the the. Um, impression that most people that get to high, especially early on the early diet days, we, that we, we're still competitive by nature. Mm. You know, like, I don't think you can get yeah. to high yield by just having fun. What do you think about this topic? Do you, would you say you're a competitive um, person? Yeah, for sure. It's, yeah, I, I would say you don't accidentally get there. Like it's, it's the rare person that, uh, gets challenged by accident because I, I think there's so many people who are competitive and want to improve. Uh, that you're just not gonna like stumble across high elo accidentally. But the thing is that I think it goes like hand in hand, like your your competitive drive, let's say you have that, it, it its focus will be on league if you're having fun in league. But also what I think is more important is kind of the social aspect of it. So one of the reasons why I wanted to climb was because like league was something I played with my friends. So. <laughs> I was playing basketball at the time and my basketball friends all played league. So we were playing together normals. I think I had like 2000 normals played before I even touched ranked or maybe I had played placements or something. But I was mostly just playing five uh, five pre-made normals. And one of the reasons why I started climbing was that I wanted to show my friends that I'm actually good at the game. So it, it was more of a, like a competition within friends because we had this one guy, <laughs> he was... Uh, he was very silent in the basketball practice always, and he was just, uh, but he's a very nice guy. He never talked much, 
And then us who had the kind of league group, we were talking and we were chatting. And then he just comes over and he says, yeah, hey, guys, um, I can play league with you. We're we are like 14, 15 years at the time. And then we're like, okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, we'll add you on. And then we're all like silver. Maybe someone is gold. And this guy comes in, he's diamond five. And and <laughs> suddenly we see him, him in a like completely different light. We, we, we thought he was the like the king of the group after that. So like, even though in basketball practice, we, we just thought he was normal. Uh, but then after that, we never saw him in the same light. It was always like, oh, this guy's a diamond five fish made of, my God, he's the best in the world. He's insane, man. <laughs> diamond back then was so yeah, that's cool. Huge. Yeah, I mean, like, that's that was close to, because remember, was there Challenger back then? Was it, no, I, season sorry. three was. No, it was a diamond straight to Challenger, right? Yeah, it went straight yeah. to yeah. Challenger. Yeah. That's right, there was no miles. So it, it was a difference. There was like a diamond one zero LP yeah. and diamond one ninety LP so and big. diamond one 99 LP. There was still like a difference there. Yeah, I was I was like hard stuck in the D1 90, 90 range there. I never got stuck there, Curtis. I went yeah. straight to Challenger. The, so yeah, but I remember there there was that feeling diamond. I was like, oh my god, that's so cool. Um, all right. So there's a lot there with Shen. Um, okay. So what I'm really interested in here as well, Expert Two, is you've played Shen for for how many years now consecutively? Uh, seven, I think. So, so yeah. seven years, a long time now. Shen has obviously been through a lot of different metas. You know, you as a, a Shen player, you've had to deal with a wide variety of metas. Has there been seasons or times during these past seven years where you're like, what am I doing? Why am I playing this, this champion when there's all these other champions? Like, have you ever had doubts about your decision to kind of go down this Shen rabbit hole? And walk us through, has your relationship with Shen as a champion kind of changed over the past seven years and and walk us through that okay so there's like there have been moments when when there's doubts and i okay i wouldn't call it doubts because it's not like i'm it's not like a committed relationship it's not like like i'm i'm obliged to only play one champion in the game <laughs> like yeah. you know it's not an exclusive so maybe, maybe relationship some people view it that way but yeah <laughs> it's not a it's not so, a, not a monogamous yeah. relationship yeah yeah but the but the moments where you have doubts is like when okay one one thing is like meta changes that's one thing but the thing that i hate the most is when when like okay i love when riot changes my champion but only when it's in a good direction okay so and i don't mind nerfs nerfs are okay but by a good direction i mean it becomes healthier for the game right uh but when Riot makes changes that I disagree with on my champion, and I consider it to be my champion because I'm so linked to it, then then I will be upset. So there was times when Riot like um, uh, removed damage from Shen's empowered Q. So this is the one that you get for like being better at the game. So you get a drag through Q through the opponent, and they removed or like decreased that damage a little bit. And I was really upset about it because I thought this was not the right direction. Because for me, uh, Shen is too strong in the hands of newer players because of his ultimate, right? You can just play Shen, in my opinion, incorrectly by just farming and then ulting and winning. And you, you will have success that way. Uh, and I, I consider it incorrectly because you're not utilizing the kind of champion's kit to its full potential because he has so much like fighter capability and all this other, other stuff that you want to kind of utilize. And they buffed that aspect in relation to the other aspect, which was my like hyper aggressive play style. And I was really upset about it and I could not get past it because I was so kind of hung up on my own play style that I refused to adapt it, I guess. And, and it always takes a while then to just accept the fact that, okay, well, I can't change this Q back, so it's just going to be like this. So I can't anymore get level one solo kills consistently. Because I, I, I used to be a menace back in the day. You, you guys don't even know. I was killing these guys like every single game level one because people did not play Shen. And then afterwards, when Shen didn't help uh, and me were in the like challenger ladder for a couple of years, then people started realizing, okay, you have to respect Shen level one and don't give him free drag throughs and he's not a problem. So then no longer could I like just cheese opponents all the time. But that's how I got started. Like I was literally like, <laughs> I was playing in a amateur team uh, and my ADC said to me, okay, Petu, um, I tried Shen yesterday. 
and I used your advice to always every single game go for level two solo kill, and it just works. And I was like, yeah, that's the champion. You don't need to do anything else. But then when the champion changes, you kind of start doubting. And I have had these moments where I kind of stop playing Shen for a while, or I stop playing League, uh, both of those. And I think that's like natural. I think you should have breaks because when I come back, it's always more fun, for more fun, more refreshing. Uh, and League is a better experience. But recently, I, for example, uh, quit Shen to learn Talon for quite a while. And I think this ties into our concept about fun, because uh, you were saying that it doesn't matter how the game is going if you're having fun. And this was my kind of <laughs> feelings with Talon, because it was really difficult for me to adapt to the Assassin play style. So there were a couple of games where things did not go so well. Let's say I'm like 0-6 or something on Talon. But I was still having fun because I was just parkouring over the enemy walls and there's like 10 people chasing me, including my team. <laughs> and I, I'm just parkouring and I, I'm in the zone and it's fun. But yeah, so mom, there have been doubts, uh, but usually taking a break and coming back uh, kind of makes things more fun. And, you know, it's it's. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned your talent journey because I saw on your YouTube, I was like, wait, what? You, you, you picked up talent. So... Yeah, walk us through that as well. Obviously, you know, you, you've been a, such a long-term Shen player playing Talon. Did, did you play it mid or jungle? Or uh, Initially mid, but I, then I changed to jungle because uh, I like the control that jungle gives and also felt like the role was more consistent for me. Right. So what was that journey like, kind of uh, getting out of your uh, head with Shen and, and walk us through that journey? And what, So is that journey done? Like, did you finish Talon or you dropped it? Or like, walk us through, what's, what's the go there? Mm. So I, I will start by saying that it's like the, the, let's say the initial part is done. So my kind of motivation was just to force myself to try to play one champion for like an extended number of time, like games, because I think in the past, uh, I have had this feeling that I am not allowed to play other champions also sometimes, because I feel like Okay, I tried them for two games, and then I'm like, oh, well, this is not Shen. It doesn't feel like Shen. It's not fun. I'm not winning, and it's difficult. But then I was talking to a friend of mine who's also a challenger, uh, and he was telling me, like, yeah, yeah, just, like, you have to pump the first 100 games in, and then the champion, like, starts flowing. And uh, then I was looking at different champions. I literally went through the list one by one. I looked at every single champion in the game, and I thought, okay, what is the champion that I will have fun even if I'm losing, like like in every single game, even if I'm losing, what is the champion I can have fun with? So I started going through the list and I'm crossing people off. Okay, well, I don't want to play Kassarim because games are going to end before 15 minutes and I won't reach my power spike. Not going to be fun. Okay, uh, I don't want to play Katarina because I don't want to ruin my fingers by spamming <laughs> all the time. But I did it, did it. I'm going through the list and then there's like a couple of champions left. And there's like a maybe a Viego, there's a... Uh, Talon, and there was maybe, I think, maybe Camille was on the list. And then I was like, okay, out of these, I don't want to play Camille. I think I just want to play Talon. And it was a completely kind of fresh thing for me because I had not played, um, I had played the old Talon for a couple of games, like pre-rework, but I had not played at all the new Talon. So I think also one of the requirements was that the champion has to have less than 5% man rate and less than 5% pick rate. Because uh. if I want to use my time to play this one champion only, then I don't want to waste a lot of time just dodging games. So, what's really interesting... So those, those were, yeah. What's really interesting what you're saying there, Expector, you just, well, you're so blase about going different roles. So I'm assuming you're playing Talon mid, right? No, you said jungle. Yeah. Oh, you're playing Talon. I mean, mid, mid first, initially mid, oh, but mid then first, I switched. Yeah. And then he moves it to jungle. And then you're talking about playing yeah. Viego as well. So you, you, do you view, do you like the champions more than the role? What's your... Oh, yeah, it's a great one. What's what's the thinking yeah, there? Yeah, for sure. I, I don't really care about the role. Like, I like I, I, I am always just into champions. Like, I, I will pick a champion because I think it's cool, and I will play it in the role that I find most fun. And honestly, one of, part of the change... Uh, was like me moving from Shen top lane to Shen mid lane. So like 2022, end of the season, I had not played league actively throughout the season. I had I had kept like a three month break. I hadn't done YouTube videos in four months. Uh, and I was in September like thinking, okay, well, 
when I get this exam week done in school, I will have some time and maybe I'll get back into it. Uh, and then I thought, okay, well, I haven't reached Challenger this season yet. And I've been Challenger for the past uh, five years. So I should like maybe maybe try to go for it again. I played a couple of games to Shen top lane. Matchups, Aatrox, Fiora, Camille, freaking Kennen top lane, something like Jace. Okay. It's in high elo, it's always this like uh, Shen does really well into tanks and versus these champions, not so well, let's say so. And and these guys, everyone is buying Divine Sunderer, Blade of the Ruined King, items that completely counter my champions. So I thought, okay, it's time for a change. First, I think Shen jungle, maybe good. Okay, clear speed is not so good. Never mind. <laughs> Shen mid lane, let's bust it out. Slam it for 50 yeah. games. I have to stop you here, Expert. This is, see, this is so our BBC <laughs> listeners. Yeah, they're going to be like, "All right, you have to call out Expert here because because our philosophy is you got to we got to play a role and learn a role." So I think it's really important to know. This is the same thing with the Bio Panther episode mm. as well because we had uh, our rank one player, or oh, he's not mm. rank one anymore, but he's always like top of our yeah. server. He's a pro player. He plays Phil to like rank one, like you know, so he can play yeah. any role. But that's because he initially oh, is Bio Panther. His name's Bio from Panther. Oh, sure. Only, uh, you, okay, I don't know right. if you know him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we had to emphasize, I think the next episode we had to say, well, guys, like, you know, you, you know, your gold, your platinum, your diamond, you can't really just do this because when you're a challenger player, you have a very good understanding of how the game works and a certain level of mechanics and a certain level of feeling of game pace. And you can, you can drag that onto other uh, roles much, very much more simply. Like you can be more of a field well, player. Well, here things. is an anomaly, and that's he's an yeah. outlier. Like, like that. That's very, very rare that you can just casually play another another role to a similar level. I don't know. Like, expected. No, no, do you but, do you think if you play, listen, if you play, I, I don't yeah. think the lane is that important. Like top lane, mid lane, it, it's the same stuff. Honestly, like there are, there are certain fundamentals in the game that you just adhere to, and like let's say top lane, it's more like. Top lane is more emphasis on on freezing waves and lane control and knowing when to take extra, extended all ins, uh, and mid lane then has more emphasis on uh, roaming uh, and more emphasis on. Uh, I mean, traditional mid laners have more emphasis on like uh, short trades, right? And top lane is more focused on long trades. But honestly, if you take a top lane champion and bring it into mid lane, it's not that different. All that changes are the matchups. And the lane is shorter. So okay, I don't wait, think hold it's on. actually that dramatic. All that changes is the matchups and all that changes is the roam and the freezing waves. Isn't that, that's massive. Well, like, well like, come uh, on, you can help me out although, here. Well, I, okay, I see where he's coming from because the lane mechanics are the same. Yeah. Right? Because the, the minions and waves are waves and lanes are lanes, right? It, it, this, the length of the lane is different and the way it feels is different. That's the sure. big one. Because yes, your job and your role changes, right? When you're playing, for example, mm. I mean, I don't, I, I mean, I can't really comment for Shenmue. I've never played Chen mid, but for a lot of other champions, like you know, for example, okay, let's take a champ that can actually play both lanes. Let's take what's what's a mid that can play both top and mid. Let me think. Yone. Okay, yeah, Yone. Okay, um, yeah, okay. So Yone mid, you're still doing very similar things. You're still a lot of the time in Yone mid, pulling waves and creating a long lane state and try all in people. But isn't Yone the is very similar, insanely different. The yeah, way you're but. Playing? but yeah, but what he's saying the the matchups are different. You got to still learn the matchups for sure, mm. um, and that does take time. That is a very feel oriented thing. But but listen, listen, dude. Every mage matchup is the same. Trust me, it's a, it's not that different. There's like yeah, okay, maybe some yes and no. are a little bit different, but uh, some things are okay, a little bit may, different. Maybe, maybe it's also a thing like okay, you've played league for let's say you have five thousand, six thousand games. That's under what your I think it is. Already. That's what so I want to emphasize. Every champion. That that's different. If you're two years into league and you've only played top lane, then you don't particularly know the cooldowns of these champions. That's true. So you you you, you have some like truth there that uh, it's it takes time. Well, you, yeah, you, I, I, yeah. You're a yeah. bit of an outlier right. in that sense. I think that you have a very good feel for the game. You've played thousands of games over many, many yeah. seasons same like, at Bio a high Band. level. I've like, played tens of thousands Same of as Biopanth. And, and by the way, there's a similarity there between all of us here. I don't know about you, but the, the normal games. Mm. He played thousands yeah. of normal games. I played thousands of yeah. normal games and bot games. Bios played thousands of ARAMs, normal games and bot games. So yeah. there is an element there. I think the average player hasn't really experienced and we've all played this at a high level. Yeah, time. this is very in interesting. I think it's important to say because sometimes when I'm talking on stream, someone asks a question and 
my first inspon- uh, like kind of instinct is to respond in a snarky way, maybe if I'm upset a little bit. And they ask something like, uh, why didn't the Sundra flash there? Or, I don't know, like something weird, which is like something that is completely obvious to me. And then I have to remind myself, okay, maybe the guy behind the screen who's chatting has not played this nerd game for 6,000 hours. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, exactly. right. Dude, we're, maybe we're it's not completely it. obvious to them. We are insanely, we're insane outliers. I mean, it, it's, it's you got to remember, we've dedicated our games, to the, our lives to the game, you know, like for pe- years. people don't have that time and, you know, new people come into the game. So I, I always believe, I think challenger players, and I've just seen this from other content creators and coaching, Challenger players have such a big disconnect with the the actual learning journey of playing the game as a new player, yeah. even and then playing in silver and gold and stuff like that. And that's what we've noticed. Like, so when Curtis and I, because we were in the pro scene, diewalls and esports and challenger all our careers, right? Mm. And then three years ago, when we started our YouTube channels, coaching, like we just realized we actually can't explain the game. Like we we, we don't know how to explain what yeah. we're doing because we have all this inbuilt muscle. It's memory. all intuitive. It's all intuitive. Oh, yeah. Hey, I have I have really great example on this. I was thinking right. about this last night when I was going to sleep that. I have really good intuition right now, which uh, let's say there's a minion wave under the tower and and the a tower is shooting. And I instinctively know in every single scenario which uh, minion the tower is going to choose next. Okay. So then I was thinking, how do I explain that? And I had no clue. Yeah, you can't. I, it's I, so hard. Like, I, I, my system too, like rational thinking, does not have any information on how the kind of tower actually chooses the targets but i have played so many games that i have automation that when i see a scenario i immediately know okay next minion is the one from the left on the top side yep. then it's gonna hit this one and it's gonna hit this and one. you'll know so how much they're gonna die it. which one i don't know target. how to explain that yeah because because league is played with what i said it's 95 percent feel you, you play each game with like 90% intuition and then there's like 10% of the time. You like, don't have time to think. The you know, game's too fast. Like a lot of our decisions are just made of pattern recognition of thousands and thousands of games and experiences and reviews. Like you yeah. review a game and you're like, oh, okay, yeah. And then and then you take that learning and you apply it where like it improves your intuition and your game sense and then you apply it next game and then you go again and again and again and then just over time intuitively you just develop a very sophisticated mm-hmm. game sense. That's what we've done over... Yeah many 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 years and yeah that you know the that's the thing with coaching that's been very difficult for us has been okay we've played this game at a high level we know what to do but explaining how to do it and how to develop that skill is the, the teaching bit. skill because this is the thing right straight up what people don't understand about coaching is that a challenger player will be able to coach and help a high elo player very well yes a challenger Um, So, for example, you as a Challenger Shen player, Mm. you would probably be the best person in the entire world to teach Shen to a Master Plus player. I think even Diamond. Even probably Diamond Diamond Plus. I would even say, yeah, D4 Plus. You were probably the best player, best person in the entire world for Shen to teach someone to climb to Challenger as Shen. Right, but because of yeah, your experiences, then, yeah, yeah. When you get when you take the low elo players, like, yeah, I don't even understand what he is struggling with. Exactly. Like, I try to explain something like, oh yeah, you just have to get better blade placement here, and then he's like, so, um, <laughs> yeah. why does my e flash not work? So. <laughs> like, like even, but even in plat, even you would, uh, I and mean, again, I'm gonna go ahead and make a bold assumption. Like, even you would struggle with coaching a platinum shen. Or a goal chain. Now, not that you wouldn't know what they need to do, but how mm. do they develop that skill and, and in what order and, and what they're actually struggling with. It's it's so hard for us to resonate as a high elo player. Like you, you, It's a skill. It's a skill that you must yeah. develop to learn to empathize and actually break down, okay, what is that person struggling with? And that is also why, by the way, like... Like, again, the... And this is actually, I think, for every, 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 uh, every coach, like... Um, I found that Master Plus in general is the easiest, they're the easiest clients to coach because it's pure just game knowledge. Mm. You don't need to explain why, or like a lot of them, or how, or you understand exactly what they're experiencing and you understand what their games are like. You understand what mm. their problems are. You can actually have a, just a straight up conversation about the game without having to over explain anything. And you understand yep. each other at an intuitive level. It's like you both feel the same things and feel at the same level, but your feeling of the game is so different to that of like a goal player, it's unbelievable. Yeah. 
I sort of call it um we so when we talk with you know other high elo players there's all this implied knowledge that we don't have to talk about so, yeah. but you have to like break yeah. it at like an atomic level about why this is you know why this mini wave is going to work this way why this when you're you know you have to teach the game and the champion in a way yeah that's right yeah, yeah. are you teaching the champion or the game that's right and that's why if someone comes to you who doesn't have shen mastery you got to start with the Shen mastery first before you even get better at the game. Because I always, what I believe, expert to, and I'd love to get your take on this, is that in league, you know, you're only ever get doing one of two things. You're either getting better at at the champion and developing champion mastery, or you're getting better at the game holistically. And I view them as separate, separate kind of entities. And like, to give you an example, like, okay, let's say, you know, you're playing Shen and you know, there's a specific trading pattern and you don't really know this trading pattern and like, or you didn't know how much damage you could do. That's like a very Shen specific, like very Shen mm. specific interaction. But then there might be stuff about like, you know, win conditions or like how you should use your R and within embedded within that, with that, the, yeah, there's an element of like Shen stuff, but like there's, that's more thinking about the game holistically. How do I win the game holistically? And mm. that's thinking about like win conditions or complimenting fed members or understanding, yeah. okay, how much gold you're going to lose on the other side of the map. Versus, this is nothing to do with Shen anymore. Versus how should game. I be using my E or my Q? Or that's my right. W. Yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts I, about I have, that? I have thoughts on this. I have thoughts on this. So I think first of all, it's like, this is a good model, what you said. Like it, it's a model, but it's it's a good model, so it's useful. So so you can have this idea, okay, I'm either improving at the champion or at the game. I don't think it represents reality completely perfectly, because I think you are always improving at both aspects. Mm. Uh, usually it's like weighted to one side more, but there is some like overlap. So you're learning both things a little bit. But I think it's a good kind of mental model to have. Yeah. That, okay, uh, if I, if I have to learn the champion at the same time. I won't have time to think about the game actually. But then what I want to say on this is that I think this is one of the reasons why uh, like one tricking or remaining a champion is the biggest cheat code you can have to actually learning at the game. Because what you said earlier, uh, like 10 minutes ago about like kind of jumping into high elo through playing one champion is this is like this is so crazy good for improving yourself uh, like as a league player because if you just play in gold games you're gonna learn how to play or you're gonna learn how gold players play okay but if you somehow manage to cheat your way up to let's say diamond 2 and you're playing in diamond 2 games doing those same let's say 50 games in diamond 2 even if you're performing like badly <laughs> uh, <laughs> you you will still learn a lot more than in those gold games so I, I think that's one of the reasons why maining a champion is so so crucial because once you don't have to like you don't have to think about the champion mechanics then you are free to think about the actual game. Uh, so that's well, this this is, but, is a but, this yeah. is a very tricky topic. So there's actually many layers to this. I want to peel back some layers here, mm. expert too. Okay. Yeah. So the first thing that I think we're all aligned on here is this, the importance of champion mastery. Absolutely. All right, champion mastery yeah. is the bedrock of League of Legends and getting better at the game and being good at the game mm -hmm. is based mm -hmm. off champ mastery. Okay. Then there's that, right? I, I think we we all get that. That's obvious. But what you said there, yeah. I want to kind of disagree with you a little bit here because okay, okay. So, so that 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 let's let's run that thought experiment for a second, right? Where yeah, you yeah. get you get your 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 goal player and you somehow get your way to a, a D two level and then you play at a D two level game and even if you're not performing well, you'll learn more. Well, that's very dangerous, right? Because is it, that's in a way you're kind of coincidentally or uh, in a way condoning getting boosted right where like let's say for example you know a lot of people oh. think this way right where they think oh if, if if someone got me to high elos if i bought this account you know i'm gold and i was in diamond i would be and now I'm, I'm playing with better players i will i will learn faster and then you know I'll, I'll be able to climb faster or whatever it might be right but i mm -hmm. in my experience i've never seen that to be the case and i've actually seen that i i mean like i understand that versing better players will improve like slightly better right will will definitely allow you to improve but i think the rank system kind of already does that in a way like the way the rank system works right is that it always places you it places you in three types of games expect to this is like again a, a, an oversimplification mm -hmm. or a model mm -hmm. it's probably not the reality but this is the way i like to think about it is that you'll have one type of game where you'll be the highest ranked player or the best player in that game and the games will feel pretty easy 
You'll be in then games where everyone is basically at the same level and you're it's like basically a very even MMR. Everyone's at a very similar level. And then you'll be in a game where you are the lowest or the least skilled person in that game. When you win, if you were to be in the, 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 the top end game where you're the lowest rated player or the worst player in that game yeah. and, and you win those games, you get a lot more MMR or in my mind, I get, I believe you get more MMR yeah. and then, and then Riot tests you because Riot has always tested you the, the way the system, I believe the system works is that it puts you in those three types of games. Now, if you lose a game where you're in the low, you're the highest MMR in that game, you're, you should be mm. winning that game and you lose that game. You lose way more MMR than the other one. That's, That's exactly way, how it works. That's right. Correct, yeah. And so, so think about it that, the rank system already does it for you as long as you get the games in. You're going to be put in games where you're versing better quality players. You know what I mean? Mm. You don't need to, quote unquote, okay. che cheat the system in a way. You see, you see where I'm coming from? Yeah, I, I like your I like your commentary on this. And it was not my intention to make it seem like like if you just randomly place a bronze player into gold. that they're Because most likely what will happen is they'll play 20 games and they'll be back in bronze. <laughs> no, no, this <laughs> like, is... We actually, had, we actually that, covered... That's what's going to happen. Did you see that guy who bought the Challenger account? It was like a couple of months ago. We covered it. Yeah. There's a, an iron player... An iron player. Who bought a Challenger yeah. account. Um, guess how many games it took him to get back down to silver. I think it went into a uh, You mean like visible rank or MMR? No, actual rank. Vi visible rank, yeah. Visible rank. Yeah. Um, From Challenger. Literally, he was literally fighting 700 LP lobbies uh, about. I think maybe, was, it, was, it was a goal, wasn't it? Was 80. It? 60 or 80. 50 games. 50 games. To silver. 50. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's how good the system is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. no. That, that makes sense, yeah. And maybe what was kind of implicit in my previous uh the thing that i said is like okay you have to also be winning like let's say more than 50 percent of the games so I i'm not saying you like play one champion uh get to high elo and then you uh start playing other champions like first timing them in ranked but i'm saying is you if you play that same champion and you're still like winning games uh this i think improves you a lot mm. Right. Like, let's say, let's say if the rank system didn't work, let's say you're, you're playing the same champion, you keep getting better and better, but the rank system doesn't put you in higher uh, bracket at all. Uh, then you would not learn as much. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we can agree on that. Yeah. 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 yeah for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Let's, t I want to talk about one, yeah, this whole thing, one tricking, because I think this is where it gets a little bit tricky, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I totally agree. One tricking is a great way to develop champion mastery in the fastest way possible, right? Because then you're exposed to, get, you know, what is a really difficult game for your champion and you're mm. forced to play those very difficult games and get creative to win those difficult games because you're not going to win those difficult games where you're getting countered normally, right? If you play stock standard, you're just going to yeah. lose. Mm. Um, and then you know what an easy game is, what a good game is for your champion, right? So I expect to mention that, I mean, I agree. He thinks that... Um, one trick in playing one champion is the biggest cheat code to gain elo like that is true yeah i would agree but then where do you draw the line though because in a way right like one of the downsides of one tricking is that and this is where it comes into champ differences mm -hmm. champ specifics like you know yeah you can one trick but then there's not that much of a difference between one tricking and two tricking or even two tricking and playing three champions um, and then having a much easier time from a draft perspective. So do you think that one tricking is like, you have to be absolute, like you have to be a maniac to one trick. You have to be absolutely obsessed. Or do you think that one tricking is a very underutilized concept that a lot of people should be uh, doing it, but they're not. So this is really interesting because like, it's kind of different. Like what I practice and what I preach are kind of different mm. because I would say, if I had to choose uh, a new player comes to the game, I would tell them to learn two champions. Like, let's say they, ideally, they have two champions that can play two roles both. So you would you would queue top jungle and you have two champions that can play both roles. I, I think that's the ideal scenario. So then you have, uh, if one of them gets picked, if one of them gets banned, if you ha need AP on your team, if you need AP on your team, you can fill that role. I think that's the, like, a theoretical uh, ideal. But what I actually do myself is like, I uh, the way I enjoy league is like serial serial one trick pony basically. It's like you don't have to 
kind of like fo force yourself to play one champion for one year. Like you don't only need to do that. But what I'm saying is that I think the fastest way to get that champion mastery is to keep playing the same champion like consistently. I think there is a difference to playing two champions. If you're if you're in champ select and you're choosing, okay, do I play Lee Sin or do I play Kindred here? I think you're already like one step behind the guy who's insta locking Lee Sin every single game. And the only thing he's thinking about every single game is uh, like Lee Sin and he is one with the champion. So I, I, I think there is like I don't know. I, I, I honestly, I don't know which is better. But uh, uh, for me, the way I enjoy the game is like playing one champion at a time. And I think every time I try to do this, like, uh, like I switch champions and I'm playing Camille and I'm playing Fiora and I'm kind of switching up the champions. I don't have as much fun because I, I, I what I, what I like is when I see the progress that I have, right, or like the progress that I have made. So the fastest way to see that progress. He's, he's just playing one champion. Yeah, it's so, by yeah, one yeah, yeah. yeah, and I see where you're coming from, but I feel like again the language you're using, it's it's not coming mm. from again a place of this is the most effective way to play the game. It's again yeah. you have the most fun. Yeah, that's what you yeah, said, I mean, right? I I feel like that. It, okay, like you have to think about the objectives you have when playing league. Like, sure, there's one objective which is like climbing, but uh, why are you doing that? I think. The most important objective is having fun. And then there are different ways of having fun. And I think for me personally, the way I kind of have fun and also climb at the same time, which is also fun, is by one tricking. Because, you know, I have some people in my program, right, that that, that this is this is what they say to me, expert too. They say, um, Nathan, I can't play one champion for more than like 20, 25 games, right? And then, um, you know, they said, that's how I have fun. Like these, actually what I find is a lot of people with ADHD struggle with this. They really mm -hmm. like to, they just have to play other different types of champions. And then I'm like, okay. And then, you know what? They, they're telling me they're having fun playing all these different champions, expert too, but then they're complaining in the discord about their rank or like their teammates or something like that. So, you know, like, I think you can easily trick yourself that you're having fun. But again, going back to originally what we said, why I loved your journey with um, Shen is that I think, uh, you, you know, so your decision to, pick up Shen because you're getting mm. results 100% you get results playing one champion only learning one champion properly again you, you said there you have a massive advantage in champ select if you instantly know already this is a champ I'm playing this is the champ I'm versing how would I play against this game how would I play this game it's a huge advantage you have but this is again it's way it, I think it's very complicated because I feel like there is a, we, we're contradicting ourselves here because I think we all are drawn to specific champions mm. because we think there's something about them that we enjoy, but at the same time, um, but at the same time, like in, at the same time, you need to win, have success with that champion to actually yeah, yeah, fully yeah, have the fun. success yeah, part is you have to win. It's two, there's like two parts, honest. right? There's two honest, parts like, there. There's the having fun, like like or like the the okay, I like this champ because it's aesthetically pleasing or it's it's just enjoyable. It's my style, but then I need to have success with it. But I feel like what you're yeah. saying, Nathan, and what the point you're trying to get across is that you can teach yourself to have fun with a champion, yes, even if it's not your number one choice because you're having success with it. Yep. And what you're saying is that a lot of people think that what they what, what having fun for them means is oh playing a lot of champions when in reality they're not because they're losing. And and when you when push comes to shove what really gives them the most fun is winning. Right. Yes. And, and winning yes. is kind of because what we're talking about here really is we we're, we're, we're kind of it's just a gray area. It's not one or the other. It's like winning is important and enjoying the champion is important. Mm -hmm. Like both mm -hmm. are important. It's just like I don't know what that ratio is. You know what what precedes yeah. the other, you know? Yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll be honest here. Like, let's say, for example, Shen had not worked out for me. Like, I, I played for 20 games and my win rate was still... You would be playing it. Let's say 55 or something. I would have just kept playing leasing. There you and go. If my leasing win rate was 60%, I would have not even tried 10. Like, <laughs> mic drop. That's a mic drop from Nathan right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you're not winning on something, yeah, it's it's for a long extended period of time. It's just not going to be fun, mm. period. No. Mm, but, but you have to understand, I think most people give up too early, in, including myself. Like 100%. Um, because when I was like, this talent journey was like really important for me to just remember how it feels to learn a champion. Because I had done this previously on, I had done this like seven day challenges. So I, I play with the same champion for seven days. But in that seven days uh, with my schedule, I get in, let's say 20, 30 games. Okay. That's not enough. Like uh, with, with Talon, it took me, 
I think 60 games to have positive win rate. And after that, like, then you start, like, actually enjoying the champion. Because the, it was, it, there's, like, a huge difference between playing 30 games and playing 100 games. And then playing 100 games versus playing 200 games. Because, and, and, and I, I would think, like, people who are not full, like, don't have full-time, uh, let's say, like, they, they can't devote eight hours a day to play league. The only way to get those numbers uh, on a champion is to one-trick. You know what I mean? Yeah, like you can't, it's time like effective. Pro players, pro players have the time to spend 10 hours every day practicing champions. Yeah. So they can play 5, 10 champions uh, and master them. And maybe maybe 20 champions, maybe 150 like mm. Faker. But like when I see someone send me an OPCG and they're in gold and they're switching the champion every game, I'm saying like, you, you can't, you don't have like, you can't afford to do that. Like you don't yeah. have the... Uh, privilege to do that because you don't play enough games to do that. If you see, if I get sent an OPGG that has less than two, three hundred games, you know, yeah. it's like, what's the point? There's nothing I can really say. Yeah. You're not playing enough of the game. Uh, I, yeah, but if those three hundred games are on the same champion, it's a completely different. That's story. right. That's yes. right. Like, there on. are some some people viewers send me. Okay, they're master tier with two hundred games and they've only played Shen. Then I'm like, yeah. Okay, now we're talking. Now we're cooking because you're like actually you know what you're talking about. Then you have two hundred games, gold four, and you have max ten games on a champion. Okay, there's nothing nothing for me to work with. Like I, I can't tell you anything. In you know, I think that's a great segue, you know, talking about your coaching. So you did the a little bit of a coaching stint recently. So mm. walk so what observations. You, yeah, what are your observations when coaching? Because obviously you don't really it's not really something you know, you're more comfortable, mm. you're from the content side and actually as a player yeah. side. So what were some of the interesting findings you had during that time where you were doing some coaching? Yeah. So just as background, the people I coached, let's say sample size is like, we will say five. Okay. And ELOs are around ranging from like low platinum to high diamond. Okay. Those are the people I've coached. And I think some findings that I got from that is that it's actually very like personal what people struggle with. Like you can't just genuinely say like, or like generalize to say, okay, if you're platinum, you need to learn this because it can be that this guy has learned how to be very aggressive and he's really great at laner, but he doesn't know anything about the macro game or he, he really struggles with making decisions uh, after 20 minutes. But then in the same ELO, in the exact same LP range can be the opposite player. So a player who has no idea how to lane, he just sits under his tower, gets like 40% of the farm, and then has very, very good like decision making. So he, he chooses the right ultimates on Shen, he uh, pings his team to go on Dragon when Dragon is up, and all this sort of stuff. So I think like that was the number one thing that I got, is that it's very like personal what people struggle with. Do you guys like agree with this? I totally agree. This we actually made a video on this ages ago, and we've spoken about this on the podcast about understanding your league journey and understanding, you know, that you know, I, the way I view it visually, if I have a visual representation, is a is kind of like a bar mm. graph, right? So imagine on the y axis you have like uh, the rating of a given skill from yeah, zero to one hundred, yeah, yeah. and on the x axis you have all the different skills. So you might have like yeah, like aggression, lane aggression, trading. Uh, you know, understanding wind conditions, wave management, whatever. And then everyone's graphs are different. And you can compensate mm. for, uh, you know, being low in one skill with being really, really high or maxing out in another yeah. skill. So everyone's bar graph is different. Um, so yes, I, I, I agree that there are, you can be at the same rank. And, be and we even see this even in, in our own games. Like there are many ways to get, you know, challenger really. Like you get players that are just incredible laners mechanic max to them and but you know don't really understand the game that well and then you know you, you do get a wide variety of them but i would say in high elo it's less like you kind of have to be high in every but in lower yeah. elo you can get insane discrepancies like incredible yeah discrepancies. exactly because with your bar graph analogy the way you can think about it this is over generalization but if you just take the mean uh like the mean of all those mm. um different bars and there are like so many different ways of combining those bars to get like a gold level but in order to get the challenger level you have to have every bar like over certain yeah uh, like yeah spot on so, absolutely spot yeah. on i totally agree with that yeah yeah no 100 percent. and 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 this is why you know it's a very this is actually a very important concept to understand because this is why fundamentally you can't compare yourself to someone else 
mm. right? Because we all get our ranks with differing skills. We all have our own skill sets. We all like to play the game a different way. You might, you, let's say, you know, I'm just going to again use Shen as an example. Someone might want to play or have more fun playing Shen to dominate lane and get get heaps of solo yeah. kills and get super fed. That's the way they had fun playing League. Someone else might have had fun playing League. They only picked up Shen because they had this insane macro ability as an R so they could impact the map. They are playing the yeah. same champion but had fun with that champion for completely different reasons. And if you respect this fundamental aspect of the game, you have a lot more... Um, I guess it's a lot easier to understand why you can't fundamentally compare yourself with anyone else, really. Mm very important i think this like comparison thing is important to say as well because i think it's a concept that i've kind of um dealt with a lot uh like just personally because i think it's like you have this at least for me like i don't know if this competitive person is like a good description but i'm a very like uh i have tendency to be perfectionist uh so this is something that i've tried to fight as well but then I have this natural way of like, okay, I'm, I'm going to compare, compare myself to the peers. So let's say I'm making YouTube videos, right? So I'm putting out one video a week, okay? But then I see, okay, well, other people who have 200,000 subscribers, they're making a video every day, okay? So I'm slacking for some reason. I'm not... Wait, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah we're just listening. Okay, my, my screen just went black for some reason. <laughs> Anyways, okay, we'll get back to it. Um, what was I saying? So, um, perfectionism yeah. and like the so, yeah, one sure video a day one versus so, one video a week. So, so I'm making one video a week. So I'm slacking. Like these guys are putting in more hours than me. They're making more work. Their videos are better edited. Uh, they're, they're like everything. They're, they're better than me. And then at the same time, I'm thinking, okay, well, uh, like I'm studying mathematics and these guys, they like, they love mathematics. Like they compete in mathematics, uh, like competitions after hours and they're like they're all about mathematics they know all the proofs and they have like so many different ways of solving these integrals that i don't really know and i'm like okay damn like am i like out of my competition here and then like i compare myself to the guys who play basketball at our gym and i'm like damn like this guy he's so good at shooting like i my my three three point shoot the shot is so bad like i I don't know. Like I, <laughs> I, I, I can't. I can't figure out why this guy is so much better than me. And then this this comes back to the bar graph thing that like we have all, all of us have like different aspects in life that we compete in. So it's never okay to like let's say you're at a certain level. Let's say your uh, League of Legends skill is silver. You can't compare yourself to other silver players because you don't know what they do. And you can't. This is for the same reason why you can't flame somebody because you're flaming somebody like hey. Uh, dude, you, you like let's say someone goes AFK for five minutes. Like, dude, you are the worst person in the human being to go for uh, like AFK for five minutes. Well, you don't know what else they do. All you know is that like small subset of their skill, and then all of the rest is completely unknown to you. So you can't like act that you are the same. And this goes like both ways. You can't put someone down for being bad at the skill you are good in because you don't know what other skills they're good at. No, yeah, uh, everyone no, is like unique in that sense. No, and then League is so good at, at tricking you because you only see that one person in one game. Mm. So you see yeah. that person, he, in, especially in the lower ELO brackets, like the average silver player, they versus this, let's say they have this teammate that does really bad. You know, they're never going to see that guy again, right? And then their perception, they're flaming him. This guy's so shit. How is he in my ELO game? This boosted. Guy, this guy's <laughs> boosted. And then little do they know, the next game, that guy could absolutely pop off, right? Because we mm. only see, we're only seeing them in one game. Um, but yeah, know, this is, this is everywhere. I mean, this is one of the, you know, this ties into a broader conversation about the dangers of social media, right? We, and how social media, we're only showing our best self. It's not like mm. you put up a YouTube video showing, you know, your shittest day or your shittest game or, you know, your, or it's not like your, your friends in university or your, your, your basketball friends are showing their, their training regime behind doors. Like you're not seeing all that. Mm. You're just seeing the day they show up. We're just saying their, yeah. their best effort, right? So like at the end of the day, that's just life, right? Isn't it? And, and League is such a great tool to teach that lesson because you get humbled very quickly or you have a very miserable experience in solo queue if you get, go around comparing yourself to everyone else. But yeah, no, I totally resonate. And I, I on the YouTube side, I, I definitely resonate. And that's one of the things for me, I had to just like 
that's why for me, YouTube, I actually gravitated away from it over time because mm. it just felt like I always felt really um, like when I started YouTube, I was very non, I didn't care about what other people said about my content or even yeah. anything. And then I found over time, I went through this spree where I was like, oh, this video didn't get as many views as that video. Yeah. And then you get in that spiral of like mm. just content. And it's just like, and then you're not even enjoying making it anymore and that's when i realized i like i was like i i don't want to do this really anymore and i mm. kind of shifted away from a content creator you know in general so like i i totally resonate with that and, it, and youtube can be very toxic in that way you just got this like big it thing is. grayed out saying 10 out of 10 and like all the arrows going downwards <laughs> yeah i mean this is also difficult because like probably most of the viewers won't like have the same experience and i, I love to talk about this topic with like other content creators because it's so uh, intuitive for us and we've all struggled with it uh, but i think like the general point there is like you you just have to ignore kind of these external signals that don't uh work towards your um goals so so youtube's goal like the company google their goal is to maximize revenue that that's literally like they have an agreement uh with their shareholders to maximize revenue but you don't have to have that same goal but youtube is trying to force upon you this goal that okay hey you have to make the most amount of money by getting the most amount of view time watch time and uh this is this what i want you to do and if you're let's say your parents want you to go to some certain go college i'm not saying that education is bad but they might have some goal for you and it not might be the same goal that you have so like i think tuning out those external uh signals is is kind of the key to really really enjoy what you're doing because you're only doing it for your own sake yeah 100 percent um oh there was something i was gonna i forgot what i was gonna say um anyway going back to i was gonna segue i think we'll segue it? back to the solo queue let's, yeah. let's just talk about yeah. solo queue well, i was um... gonna talk about solo queue <laughs> mental stuff because what i wanted to go into you know what are things from a like uh psychology mental aspect what are things that have helped you in your solo queue journey or maybe advice you give to others that you can share mm -hmm. with with our bbc community about yeah tips for solo queue mental and staying focused and performing well in solo queue okay uh i think these things are actually very easy it's like you have to make hard decisions to make your solo queue journey easy okay but once you make those decisions it's easy so number one thing is you disable chat, okay? That's number one thing. And I don't care, there's gonna be, someone's gonna say, well, you're missing out on information and you could just mute all instead of disabling chat so you can give information to your team. And what about the flash timers? And what about the uh, community, communicating enemy Elise's W cooldown? And that's all, it's, it's bull crap, okay? You're not gonna, 99% of league chat, even in like master tier is like flame honestly it's it's all flame and it's stuff that's gonna take your uh like focus away from the game because i had a like th this took a long time for me to realize because i i i have gotten i have gotten one 14 day ban like back when i was 17 i had an ego i had just first three challenger and then i played on a smurf now some, some people are gonna hate me for this but th that's just the way it went so so once you get challenger you have high queue times so you're like okay I will bring another account. So I am I'm starting in like unranked uh, from leveling up the account. And then I start going through gold games. And back then, no Smurf queue. So you could actually go to like actual gold games. Like you see actual gold players and you play versus them and you just completely giga stomp them. Okay. But then when your game goes wrong, that's when my ego comes in. And then when I have the chat on, there's going to be some gold player flaming me. And now I have this big ego. I'm 17 years old, right? I'm arrogant. And I'm thinking, like, you can't talk anything to me, bro. Like, I don't want to hear your voice. You're a gold player. Like, I shouldn't be in the same room with you. <laughs> you That's shouldn't be in the same room. <laughs> I had all this anger. Like, and then I start typing something like, gold dog, don't talk to me. Okay, 14 day ban. Then you have to really think, start thinking about, okay, what, what am I doing with this chat thing? Like, I like playing League, but I, I, I don't like this ego that is coming in. So number one is disable chat. It's going to be so much better, like... The, the only person that I would allow to chat is Muggy Felix on Europe West. <laughs> because this is the only person I have ever seen that uses chat correctly, okay? So this guy is the complete 1v9 machine. He's, okay, I have this clip. 
maybe you can find it on my Twitter afterwards, but like I'm like zero four on Shen. Okay. The guy is eight and zero on Syndra. And I'm taking damage, I make a misplay, I'm getting Caitlyn ulted, and the 8-0 Syndra at 20% HP flashes in front of the Caitlyn ultimate to save me. Okay? And I'm I'm completely blown away by this. Okay? Then I make a mistake, end up dying afterwards anyways, and the guy says, nice try, let's keep going, or something like this. Or he's like, let's go wow. team. Let's do it. Uh, he, there you he, go. Stuff like that. I'm not scratching my head why he's like always rank one. Why is he always rank yeah, yeah. Like These the, are the things. The, the solo queue system rewards fundamentally good play. And Magic Felix is a consistent rank one player. And there's a reason And he for doesn't it. lose games by flaming his team. Reduces the like, chances. Like, yeah, no, he's literally the only challenger player I've seen that every, every single game he's typing something positive. He, uh, I've wow. never seen him flame ever, anyone. I actually want to go down this rabbit hole here. I know this is a detour, yeah. but I just get so excited oh, about go, like. I, I, so your experiences in EU West, like, what makes you know? Obviously, you verse some of the best top laners in the world. Like, what makes you know these players so good? What makes the best players the best players in your mind? Versing them, like, what makes them? What makes the difference? Hmm. Okay. Uh, so my Magic Felix is my my number one. He he's my gold for solo queue. But then I've played versus, I played versus a couple of pros. So obviously, like everyone in Europe West, I I, I played versus not maybe throughout the past like two years because I have not played actively top lane challenger solo queue. But before that, I, I had a pretty good understanding. I played versus Wunder versus Pilipo versus Soas, all these uh, Euro European top laners. Uh, I think other than Pipo was always really good. But then there's another another complete beast which is like the korean players so i've played versus khan for example in the top lane and i i, I don't know it, it's it's hard to explain because there is like this different side to like having these like mechanical players because when you face them and and it, it's it's insane because you can have like a you have a completely different feeling about the game like i i've played versus a lot of good european players but when, when, I, when I played versus Khan, he was playing Lucian top lane versus me. It was, it was like, the game suddenly felt like it was like somehow, I don't know, it, it, it was slowed down or it was fast paced, but it was something was different about the game because he was doing all these different things. It is, I don't know, it's an intuition thing again. Like I can't really explain it. Magic Felix, I can explain rationally that he's, he's a good, really good team player. He always is very positive. And he's very consistent. But I think one thing that makes like a really great solo queue player is the fact that they don't like they don't take these 50-50 plays. They they only make decisions. I, I think like okay, recently from my Talon experience, I have to give shout out to this guy, um, Chaos Tansa or Chaos, who is like the he he's the best Talon jungle player in the world. And he's consistently, I think right now he has four accounts or three accounts in Europe West, 1K LP Challenger. And this guy, he never takes like fights that he, he doesn't know he can win. So he only takes fights he knows he can win. So he's only making decisions so that he's always alive. He's always the one who's in control of the game. And you can just tell that this guy is somehow different because uh, let's say I'm not, I'm not the best player in the world and I make these decisions that I will like do some coin flip plays. Like I will be like, okay, well, we can take this like all in or we can take this baron and it's it's gonna be maybe fifty percent of the time I lose it or maybe thirty percent of the time I lose the game because of it, but seventy percent of the time I win, it's fine doing that. But these guys they're hundred percent, like they don't take like unnecessary risks at all. Makes sense. So sorry, we'll go back on track to the uh yeah. Mental stuff. So the number one, your first advice was disabling chat. These well, are these are expertus yeah. expertus. advice for good relationship with solo queue. Yep. Yeah. Number two. Yeah. So that was that was number one. Then other hard decisions that you have to make is actually like outside of the game. So one thing that I will come back to is like replay analysis. And that's another, another thing that you have to look at. But then other thing is I think people can't forget about stuff like sleep, nutrition, taking breaks and stuff like this. And I know it's like, it sounds like I'm preaching something like, 
uh, that I don't, I don't know. Like it's, it's, it's like it's what your parent advice. or like a teacher would say. It's like, you got to make sure you eat your great vegetables. Yeah. yeah it's like, yeah, thanks but, for the obvious. I'm serious about this. Like <laughs> you, you're like, once you realize the difference, it's so crazy. Like for me, I, I live a very privileged life because I can, I can be afforded the opportunity that I will go to sleep at uh, 10 PM and I will not have an alarm and I will wake at 8 AM and I will have 10 hours of sleep. And that's when I'm ready to play solo queue, okay? Because I, I never put myself in a situation, if I want to climb, I'm never going to play solo queue when I have slept poorly. I'm never going to play solo queue when I'm upset about something. And I'm never going to play solo queue if I have lost two games in a row. So, like, I, 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 will, I will just stop playing because I know that if I can't objectively think about the game, if I can't put my feelings aside, if I'm not 100% focus mode, if I have not eaten, so one thing is like streaming makes you have this kind of unhealthy behavior because you kind of want to keep the content going all the time. And let's say you're streaming for long hours, something like five hours, six hours. Some people are gonna stream for 10 hours. Uh, you don't have the, I don't think no anyone has the capability to sit on your computer and focus for more than two to three hours like yep. and, and you can't tell me that you have the same focus as you did like two hours ago if you have not taken a break if you have not walked if you have not eaten have drank, drank water so all this like physical properties thank god it's so refreshing to hear this like yeah. just thank god <laughs> it feels like sometimes we're insane where we feel like we're like we say you know we're big believers in like kind of playing in blocks of three or four games like because yeah. you know the the brain can in, in if you're playing high intensity league of legends you know it's very 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 hard to stay focused for more than like two hours like to play mm -hmm. your best league of legends like it's really hard you know and sometimes i feel like we're we're anomalies and we're just like we sound crazy but it's re it's it's true like it just do it yep. feel it it's how yeah. we've improved it's how i'm exactly significantly you know uh thank god this is Actually, one of, the, one of the things why it's so difficult is because at the same time as your concentration decreases, also your kind of ability to evaluate your uh, concentration skill decreases as well. So you might think that, okay, well, I'm still, yeah, I'm fine to play. Obviously, I can play two league games in a row, but I don't think that's obvious because I think the first league game that I play, I'm going to play a warm-up ARAM and then I'm going to play a solo queue game, okay? And that's gonna be fine. Then ideally, I would take 15 minute break if I'm like if the day is reserved for solo queue. If I'm like that's the only thing that I want to do. Let's say I would take some some break, just just walk around a little bit, and then I think the next game that I will play will be the best one of the day. Okay, because I have gotten warm up, I have got like mechanical warm up, and then I have gotten mental warm up from playing a solo queue game, and then I will have my best game, and after that. I think the rest of the games are not going to be as high quality and that's like only three games that i've played because there's like maybe you can play a couple of more if you take breaks but yeah it's just there's no way to be as proactive as you are because there's so much you can do in league like the best best like gameplay that i have put out is when i'm like really concentrating i'm using like uh i would say f keys but they're not actually f keys because on my keyboard i have this like um i have like instead of space bar i have like four thumb keys for each thumb so i have by like bound so that basically be previously i had them on c x v and space bar but i'm using my thumb to basically move my camera so the best league of legends i have played is when i was really concentrating every single minion last hit that i'm taking in between that i'm checking every single lane at the same time i'm pinging every time my laner goes away i'm pinging every single call that i want to make and i'm playing mechanically perfectly and i can't do that for two games in a row no. there's just there's, there's no way so you can't tell me that a gold player they're gonna be like yeah, no i was focusing yeah yeah I was that's focusing. what they always say at they the tell time, you that i can they easily die, focus. they're bringing up a youtube video <laughs> i have this friend who, who i played league with back in the day and i was watching him play league he dies and he starts watching a youtube video <laughs> Like, yep. Old it's, tab, it's check the phone. It's a death timer, bro. What are you watching a yeah. YouTube video for? Like, <laughs> I, I actually did a video with, uh, uh, you know, Kira. Uh, he's like high low EU as well. Um, okay. And he said that he he use, he goes on his phone sometimes during deaths and stuff. And <laughs> he says like, he has his advice, like get off, like get your phone in another room. Like people yeah. always are on their phones yeah. and stuff all the time. They like, they're like in the dead, like quickly check their messages real quick and then go back to the game. Like that just ruins your focus, dude. 
Yeah, I literally had someone come to a review this week who we reviewed his seventh game of a block. And I'm like, just to preface, man, I'm like, nothing, it's, this is a very, very shit, this is, we're not going to get gonna much learn it. You're not even playing at your best, so we can't learn anything You can't learn if you're not playing your best. What are we going to learn from this? Mm. Unbelievable. And then, wait, to, uh, to like kind of finish the, the point is, I think like, once you're in that peak physical condition, peak mental condition, that's where you can actually like improve because it's one thing. One thing is to like perform right at your skill level, but in order like in order to climb, it's not enough to perform at your skill level because you have to raise your like skill level in order to climb. That's that's the people uh, like that's the thing people forget is like they think okay I have to play better, I have to play better in order to win more, I have to play better in order to climb. No you also have to improve. You have to like, ra- like raise your baseline in order to climb because the rank at the end of the day, it's meant to reflect your level of skill. Yeah. And just playing well does not improve. That is not the same thing. You know that, you know where league tricks you in this? This is the biggest one. This is why we actually, t- we've actually had an episode before about win streaks are toxic because it makes you yeah. look like you're like, you know, it looks like you're improving. But if you're not reviewing mm. and getting into the details, which is one of our favorite scenes, you actually don't know. Like I, I reviewed a, a Zach game today. I think he was gold mm. for silver one. He ended the game nine and oh, uh, like 25 yeah. uh, minute game or whatever like that. And uh, we were just reviewing all his like Q usage and E usage and every single fight he was misplaying his champion, every mm. single fight. And if you went away to that game, like I played really well, you know, again, that's just that game. You know, the next game here, you're still going to be misplaying all your Zach Qs and yeah. E's, right? It's so important. And and th- I, I, I'm actually going to steal that from you, expect to about people yeah. just want to, um, what did you say? You said about that people think they need to play better or play well rather yeah. than thinking about improvement Improving. because that is yeah. the biggest bait. Like your scoreline in League of Legends is such a bait because if you play that game where you smurf and you get that little MVP on APGG, mm. you're going to think you're so good. And if I if I just do that, replicate that another 10 times, I'll be climbing. But, you know, again, there's just certain factors in that certain game that made mm. you go that way. But let's say you suck at certain situations. You can't, you know, you just got lucky with hitting some abilities or some fights. So I really like that. Um, yeah. Um, yeah and i think one thing to realize there is like even if you like let's say you put 100 percent of your focus in you cannot as a gold player play like faker in that game the only way to play like faker okay maybe we should pick someone else like <laughs> the only way to play like a challenger player is to uh, gradually increase your level of knowledge about the game increase your habits that you're creating it's all about creating habits in the game so that you kind of automatically raise the lowest uh, level of gameplay that you're going to put out. Because I think you should look at it from the perspective that you have this some kind of like center or central location around which your skill level is. And then the level of focus that you put out in a game uh, kind of determines how far away from that uh, like location of skill you move. So you have some kind of variance. So the thing you can improve by focusing is uh, how like uh in which part of the variance are you in but the thing that you can improve by focusing over a long period of time and focusing on improving is the actual location so then once that location of the skill goes up then even if you have a bad game you're still going to perform better than you used to before i see what you mean you're saying like raising yeah raising the lowest baseline of your play yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean i guess you can have this is it like a military saying that uh uh, like when when it's a real situation you don't uh how is it like yeah you don't, you don't want to think you just do but you fall to the level of your uh like training or something like this yeah no the way i well, you know given that you're a maths major you, you would probably be able mm. to understand this better than i but the the uh the graph or like the visual rep- representation of what you describe what I, the way i view yeah. it is like a bell curve right and let's say the middle is the mm-hmm. mean that's your rank right now so let's say you're platinum yeah. two right yeah, yeah, yeah on the right hand side you'll have some you know some games you might play at a d4 level but it's it's very mm-hmm. uncommon and then on the left hand side you have like let's say p4 but that's also uncommon yeah. so then, then then so there's two ways of interpreting getting better at the game there is increasing the the height of your of your best gameplay. So pushing that from a D4 to a D2, 
but then there's, there's also pushing up the baseline so that d that your worst that for your worst game so so you know in league you got to do both you got to increase the baseline but then you also got to increase the the highs you know the high end of that spectrum yeah, yeah yeah exactly like that so that's what i meant like okay location is like a technical term that you use in mathematics but it means the mean uh, right. mean of the distribution right so okay that makes sense yeah spot on yeah and i i really like that as well is that it's not good enough to just play well you got to play well but then get learning from it which leads us into mm. what is you know reviews you spoke a little bit about their reviews yeah. and analysis this leads us to the third point that i think is like the, the third hard decision that you have to make and it is actually like taking time out of let's say let's say you play on average four games a day that's a lot already but let's say you play four games a day uh you have to sacrifice one of those games to take time to look at over the three three other games because this is going to improve improve your skill level more than just playing more games right you will spend like actual time thinking about what you did wrong because this is like one of the cheat codes that i used um when i initially climbed the challenger wait nordic is challenger disclaimer so initially that climb was like only fueled by the fact that i had this notepad file where every single game that I played, I wrote down what I did wrong and what I need to improve. And honestly, at the time, it was more of a motivation thing for me because I, I was really in this zone of like, okay, I'm, I'm going to be a really good League of Legends player. So what would a really good League of Legends player do? Okay, he would have this notepad of like, I think I saw it from some streamer at the time that they had a notepad of all the games they play and then wrote down just a couple of sentences about each one. So I didn't initially think that it's going to be like massively important. But when I look back on it, I think that was one of the reasons uh, why I climbed so fast, because that was the first time, like I had played already, let's say 3000 games of League of Legends at that time. But that was the first time that I actually started looking at my replays. And I think like this is something that people say you should do. Everyone wants to have reviewed replays, right? But no one actually wants to do it. There is one guy who I see constantly review his replays on stream, and that is Agurin. He's a, a German Europe West jungle streamer. You probably know him. Yep, we know so, him. Yeah. So this guy, every time I tune into his stream, if he's in queue, he's watching one of his own replays. And I think this is like, this is so impressive to me because even if you're not streaming, not many people do that. But this guy is doing it every single game when he is streaming. And, and that just shows you this guy. This is the reason why this guy is consistently rank one on Europe West, because he's like never stagnating. He's always evolving his game. And I think for me, I, I got complacent at some time uh, when, I, when I was challenger, because I thought like, okay, if I'm already like rank 20 Europe West challenger, I, I don't need to like, I don't need to watch my own replays because there's nothing to learn from it. It's kind of, uh, okay, this is like over and shut, uh, exaggerating. I just need to play better to get fun. higher rank. I just need to play yeah, better. I just play better. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So uh, I stagnated for a couple of years. I, I didn't actually improve instead of like, okay, there's this gradual improvement that you do automatically, but I didn't put that effort in to improve. And then you get uh, kind of annoyed by the fact that you have not improved. But I think you just have to take responsibility for actually improving. Totally agree. Um, and that were the three rules. So to TLDR that, the yeah. first one was muting, deafen. Disable the disable chat. chat. So we're talking about in the disable settings, chat. disable it. Disable it in completely. The settings, yeah. Um, the second one was... Um, what was the Physical second? and mental condition oh, yeah, through sleep, uh, uh, hydration and eating. Yep. So the physical part of the game. And then the third one was reviewing. And these are the three uh, decisions, the tough decisions hard you have decisions. to make. I like hard. that 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 you yeah. use the word. T it's not like do these things. You have to identify that these are hard things to do. Yeah. And and the theme but here, after day, what, like once you have made that decision, like okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on this. Like I, I I'm gonna replay a review and I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna disable chat. After that, it's easy. It's, mm. it's not hard because you remove all these distractions. Like when you disable chat. You don't have to think about chat after that, but you just have to make that hard decision because at the time of making the decision, you're thinking, oh, but I'm not going to have as much fun playing League because I'm not going to get to banter with the enemy team and and all this sort of like 
I think it's irrational stuff. But then once you do that hard decision, it's gonna be easier afterwards. Uh, you know, it reminds you of the you know that Jocko Willink, that that guy on YouTube. He's like the military guy. Have you heard of him? Uh, is he the extreme ownership? Yes. Guy? Yeah. Yeah. That guy. Yeah, yeah. And he has something where you know he's big on habits and discipline yeah. and how discipline equals freedom. And in a way, it's kind of like you're removing decision fatigue. Once you've made that decision, uh -huh. okay, I'm going to review and I'm going to do this. And I'm like, it's like, decide your pool, decide how you're going to review. You've made all those decisions. Then it's just getting the reps in. You, you don't have to think, oh, mm -hmm. should I review? Should I stick with this champion? Should I get play yeah, after exactly. it, after five hours sleep? You know, it's, it's like those decisions are already made for you. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah, the kind of yeah. the way I interpret that. Create a process and just go full just forward. Steam ahead. Just do it. Let it, let the process do its, do its yeah. work. I think there's like... There's, there are like times when you have to take a break and you have to like reevaluate your own systems and or process, as you said, and your habits. But then there are times where like you don't need to do that all the time. Because let's say, for example, you're working out, you're trying to create some kind of uh, workout routine. And if you keep changing every single week, the exercises you're doing, you're never going to get like those uh, like compound interest kind Juicy of benefits gains. that you get from doing the same thing <laughs> over and over again and like improving on the fact that you have improved previously. So you have to ha have some time also to kind of, um, let's say, yeah, full steam ahead. I was trying to think of a better word, but I'm lack of vocabulary is hitting me here, but... So you heard it here first. To execute, execute on the systems. You heard it here first from Expatio. If you want the juicy gains at the gym, you got to stay consistent and not change your routine too much. And this yeah, is but then, then like at some point it becomes like stagnation. So then you're not, I don't want to do the same routine for three months in a row. So yeah. after two months, I will change it or something. But yeah. yeah. Uh, and this is also, I like the word compound interest. We should use that as for the process. We compound mm. interest our process. Mm. We, this is now a financial podcast as well. <laughs> the Broken My Concept podcast. We compound interest through our process. Um, yeah. uh, one thing I just want to kind of say here, a quick one is EU West versus EU NE. You've played on both <laughs> servers. Walker, so what's the difference there? Okay, so I actually answered this on stream yesterday, so I have it in good working memory. So the first thing to realize is, okay, if you're a gold player, if you're a platinum player, just choose the server where your friends are, okay? It's as simple as that. Because usually... Okay, there is some ping difference depending on the country, but for Finland, for example, uh, Nordic East and Europe West are completely same ping. So there is no ping difference. So if you're gold, if you're platinum, uh, if you're silver, if you're iron, bronze, it doesn't matter. Uh, like it's the same stuff, okay? But above diamond, there's a huge difference because every single good player from Nordic East will transfer to West. So all that is left on Nordic East are some one tricks, some ego inflated players or some players who don't know that Europe West is better. And it's, it, it's, it, there is no competition like which server is better. And yeah. I, th I think just to emphasize the point, at the same time as I was ranked three challenger on Nordic East, I was diamond two on West. Oh, wow. So that's a very, very big discrepancy. That's ginormous. Yeah, I actually have a uh, Marcy e, uh, coaching client who was EU Nordic East and he got, uh, yeah, I think Diamond 4, um, he was Diamond 4, and he was Platinum 3, Platinum 4 for a long time. He just hit Diamond 4 after like a year mm. um, um, playing at EUS. Mm. So, um, yeah, that's the experience that I've had with my coaching clients. A question that I have here, this might be a hard question or a really easy question. Uh -huh. <clears throat> what is something in the league community, let's say it's Reddit or Twitter, or, um, you know, you see, so you see, see this comment or this that just makes your blood boil, maybe just annoys you or something. Like what's something about the <laughs> league community that just annoys you? Like whether it's relationship with the game, solo queue, people's misunderstanding. Mm, this is, this is interesting. I've kind of, there, I, I probably could have answered this question easier or like uh, faster, let's say four years ago when I, cause I, I used to be a very like avid user of the League of Legends subreddit. I, I, I wrote on Summoner School, I wrote on uh, Arshen. I was like, actually, that's how I started off making YouTube videos. Is I, uh, I wrote these like on my iPad th throughout the summer when I was I w at that summer cottage. I could not play League, 
So the closest thing to League was thinking about League matchups. So I was writing like matchup guides for Shen uh, on the re- subreddit. And I was browsing our League of Legends daily. Uh, I didn't check Twitter back then. Now I, now I check Twitter sometimes. But yeah, I was really big on that. And I think what like annoyed me the most back then was kind of this misconception about Shen that people had. Because people thought that Shen is like a passive champion. And even like Shen mains, it used to be on, on the Shen subreddit, people would be like, oh, I'm really like, I'm, I'm struggling with this matchup because like I can't farm and stuff like that. And I, I'm writing there like, go all in level two. Like you're <laughs> crazy strong, like please. And there were like people who are like, from my point of view, they're playing the champion completely wrong. Like they, they don't understand what the champion is about. But then when I look back on it, it's also like, um, this comes down to the uniqueness of the playstyle. So it necessarily because level two all-ins work back then doesn't mean that's the only way to play the champion. But I remember that's something I got annoyed about. And in general, I think like one thing that I always got annoyed about was when people played my champion uh, poorly, right? So, so if someone picks Shen from me in a solo queue game on the enemy team, for example, and they play it poorly, I'm upset because I was like, Bro, I could have played that champion this game. I could have showed you how it's done. But now you played my champion and you made it look bad. <laughs> I love it. Is it we, we think we spoke about that before, like kind of it's like personal. When someone plays your champion, it's like personal. Because it's yeah. like you. It's like that's you. It's there. invading your your home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, now now I remember you just you just brought up some old feuds, man. We used to have this battle on Twitter versus Trutut because Trutut was like a Shen hater, because there was a time when Shen was meta. Uh, like, I think it was two years ago, um, when me and Shending Help were high low, both of us, and people started playing Shen, and then Trutut was on Twitter complaining, he's like the Camille player, whatever, and he's complaining, like, hey, Shen is so, he's so easy to play, and he's the most broken top player in the game, I hate all Shen players, and I remember that just got my blood boiling, like, I was... I was trying to go to sleep, and I kept thinking, like, this guy's disrespecting the champion. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean that's it for me Nate. do you have any other major questions here or do you want to get into the video I think what we'll do now is we'll look at the famous we're going to get the get into the, the gameplay the expetu commentary oh, yeah. here so um, let's get this game up and we'll get into the details with expetu shen alright guys so we're diving into a, a VOD this was a recent a re- one of your recent YouTube videos that at the time of this podcast isn't even out yet so we've got um, exclusive access exclusive access <laughs> so this was what, what what rank was this played at this is um, I think it's like low master medium master elo your best anyways okay so so let's get into the expertu mindset level 1 do you care much about level 1's expertu how do you think about level 1 yes yes every single game on invading it doesn't matter what what uh, opponents have they have bleach crank they have karma i'm invading this is wow. my, my favorite path right here where we take the top lane kind of uh, uh, hug the wall and then go into the tri brush right so you'll ping at level 1 you'll just ping assistance on the top side bush and try and yes, do this. Uh, being on my way and assistance, and you do this starting from second one. So, like, immediately as the game starts, I'm pinging it. Because there's a difference between pinging it, like, at 15 seconds at, and one second. Because if the bot lane starts already going to bot lane, they're not going to come to your mm-hmm. invade, most likely. So you need to do it immediately as you spawn. So this is a game where you're versing a Camille. So w- walk me through. This is the team comps here. I mean, we'll actually go back when you press the... So you don't block it. So... When you look at this comp, what's going through your mind, level one? I mean, do you even care? Do you even look at the comp? Like, let's just get real practical. Do you yeah. do you tab and like actually think? Like, what do you think? Like, what's practically how you actually play that your games? Mm, well, level one, I'm not actually. Well, usually, what I think about level one is: do we have CC abilities? So we have LeBlanc E, we have um, Milio Q. Okay, that's our CC. But usually because I'm playing Shen, we have that initial CC, which is my E. And if we can have something to chain uh, up on, it's very easy to get kills level one. And I think the most important thing level one is to be proactive, right? Because if you're being proactive, you already have. It doesn't matter if you're making the kind of wrong decisions, so to say, if you're making suboptimal decisions. But if you're making it proactively and making it as a team, you already have an advantage on your opponent. But I'm not so much thinking about, honestly, I'm not so 
focused on let's say I don't I don't really care about what the bot lane matchup is I, I or I don't care about what the mid lane matchup is what I care about is maybe enemy jungler ideally I would think about what jungle path he's gonna take but I don't actually know this so I don't really know I know fiddlesticks can do some wolves raptors things fast and all this sort of stuff but I'm mostly thinking about uh, the invade at the start okay do you care about leashing or starting in lane um so leashing is pretty bad in general in top lane because kind of taking control of the wave in the early levels is really important in most matchups. Uh, so I'd rather like not leash. If I'm leashing, I want to have Q and I want to give a pretty good leash. Uh, usually I would start at Q level one, but since we invaded, I, I took E. Okay, so you're starting trades with E here. So this is the expert to aggression here. So walk us through, what's, what's your, you trying to get level two first? What are you trying to do here? Yeah, ideally level two. What I'm looking at at the time is like, I'm trying to get as many grasp uh, out of attacks as possible. Here, I managed to zone Camille of the experience because I got level two. And <laughs> this would not be possible if I did a longer leash mm. uh, for uh, Kha'Zix, right? So it was very important that I got to lane because then I can start stacking up my grasp and being aggressive. Uh, honestly, right now, I'm not the best top lane laner. I think just because I have not played top lane a lot, mm. I don't have the... Like kind of matchup knowledge that you should, and also because of the item changes, I don't know which champions. Okay, this we have to look at this. Okay, so let's get into the details here. So you've got you've got kind of like the wave shoving into the Camille here. You start yeah. to stand your ground. You even ignite there. So walk us through this. What, what's what's the, the mindset yeah. with ignite? How do you think about using ignite? Is it? Yeah, I actually didn't okay. even notice that you got ignite versus. So walk us through ignite in general, because again, pretend we're Shen noobs. Here. We have no idea what we're talking yeah. about. Not pretend we are. Oh yeah, yeah we're, we're idiots. Yeah, I don't even play top lane. I don't know how this role works. So I I've been a huge advocate of ignite all, all this kind of time after season seven or something. I know it's okay to play Shen with teleport as well. That's not the way I enjoy him. I enjoy playing Ignite because it allows me to uh, be much more aggressive and utilize Shen's early game power. And one of the main reasons why you can go Ignite instead of TP is because um, you have your ultimate, right? So most top laners, in order to have effect on the game, they need to have TP so they can split push and they can join their team when the team fight begins, okay? But Shen does not need that. So since we don't have a combat ultimate, we will usually be like weaker in terms of 1v1. But if you can augment your kind of combat ability by taking the Ignite Summoner spell, uh, that will make you into an actual champion. And now the usage of Ignite here, the reason why I do it is because he's using a health potion, right? And he's using, a, he has Doran Shield healing. And he has also, also this sort of stuff. And I think if I Ignite early, uh, I will have kind of an advantage in terms of kind of hmm it's, it's hard to say it's more of a like a feeling kind this of is where thing. intuition is yeah like, I, I'm, I'm very into using ignite like aggressively so i know that i can use ignite even though it does not result in a kill some people they just use ignite when they know only they when they're low hp yeah, that's it's right lane control. I think, like, it's lane control yeah. ignite I, I, it's like in uh, in mid i see you see lane control r's with champs like oriana and stuff just using it for yeah. for lane control and then you can use that to you know get a better quality wave state mm. yeah exactly because i'm kind of just trying to maximize the damage that i can put out with the summoner spell and in that moment uh, if I can reduce the healing from Doran's shield, if I can reduce the healing from Ignite, uh, and I can put Ignite on cooldown, which means it's going to come back at uh, some point, uh, I'm just getting the maximal value out of the summoner spell. This is a, Nathan, this is a really weird gank, isn't it? From a fiddle perspective, because the waves, I mean, obviously the waves in a gankable position, but like. You know I, that I, Kazakh started I, I, I have to give you context on this because I played versus this fiddle the game before. And we had a little bit of a feud, so he was like perma ganking me. I don't know if he, and he just had some kind of agenda against me. Okay, so then my mo like kind of mindset was when I go into this game, I'm gonna do any everything in my power to kill Fiddle. We got the early invade off to kill him, and I think he's just pissed off. Right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think this is let's just full clear as Fiddle. Who cares about who cares about Kimul Shen matchup? It's here, a honestly, terrible you know? gank. Yeah. All right. Well, you get out of get out of it. Yeah, I think what was important was flashing the Camille E there. Yes. Because if yeah. I get hit by Camille E, I'm probably going to die to the gank as well. Yeah. And by the way, I would have flashed it even if 
um, Fiddlesticks was not there. Uh, just because, like, what oh. I get out of that is I dodge a lot of damage. So I, I the way I look at, like, summoner spells is I don't think about, am I going to die here? I'm, I'm thinking about how much value can I get from the summoner spell. Same so as Ignite. Same as Ignite. I, I, I save a lot of HP. Yeah. Wow, so you would flash that even if it was in the one v one, because then you're healthy, you're really 100%, 100%. healthy. One hundred percent. I I actually saw fiddlesticks like the moment I had already decided to flash. <laughs> wow, yeah, interesting, very unique. Because yeah, when that's you think all... about it, you don't have TP, right? So you have no cheat code to get back mm. to full HP. So if you just go back to the previous, uh, this, uh, like look at the HP bars when I did the flash, and if we think about how much damage I'm gonna take. Uh, by not flashing, it's gonna turn the lane completely around. So, so kind of, it just I use it like a heal here. Okay, so look at the HP bars. If I don't flash, I will have maybe 250 HP or 200 HP, and playing the lane out will be difficult. But in this situation right now, if Fiddlesticks doesn't come, I can bully this Camille really well. Mm. Yeah, so it's not even about the gank. Yeah, it's not even about the gank. And on, yeah, you're spot on because you don't have TP. You actually need to stay healthy. Because yeah, yeah. you just lose lane control. And if you don't have TP, you're screwed. So it does make sense when you think about it. And I could have maybe killed the Camille there in that situation if Fiddlesticks doesn't come. You really? I, I Yeah, I, I guess. I mean, you... Yeah, I guess like, you have yeah, a big I, minion. I have, I have two seconds on my Q and E. Uh, mm. Both of CC abilities, so it's possible. Yeah. All right, so why not base your expert too? Oh, uh, we can't do that. We don't base. <laughs> we, we, we fight like champions. <laughs> So 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 the way I'm thinking, I still have second wind, and I have Dora's shield, and yeah, Camille used her ignite, so she does not have like surprising amount of damage. So the way I'm gonna do this, I'm just gonna soak the experience, and if I recall right now, I'm gonna be really behind in levels, and for me, it's much more important to stay um, like on par with levels than it is to get uh, maximum CS. Most champions or let's say late game scaling champions, other champions, they want to get gold. Uh, all I care about is experience and denying experience. Interesting. Okay, Wave's in a bit of an awkward position. It's, re it's really awkward. It's really awkward. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we just got to kind of pray that the, 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 yeah, the healing comes through. This is part of the like gameplay that uh, I think most people don't like ignite chen for that mm. you're not running tp is situations like mm. this because they just feel completely hopeless here because you think that okay if i stay i'm gonna die if i recall i'm gonna lose so much but i think you just have to kind of yeah <laughs> you, you have to use this is why you have to have second wind well ignite time, is, shield is necessary well even in mid it's a feast or famine uh, you know summoner in a way right like yeah. if you if you yeah. know how to use it and you're going to get value from it then great but if you if you're taking like what i say typically say with ignite is if you're not get if you don't have a plan for like what how you're going to use it if you're not using it with intention you're just going to get mm. screwed over pretty hardcore yeah and i would like to mention on the summoner spells i've actually now i've been playing mid lane i honestly think the best summoner spells are ignite heal Okay. I don't want your opinion on this. <laughs> oh, well, okay. So I, okay. So I used to be a big Fizz player and um, mm. no one was doing this. I was, I realized that, you know, uh, flash on some of these champions wasn't, it wasn't actually necessary because um, you have a lot of mobility anyway. And, you know, if I was vulnerable, I wasn't going to be using my abilities aggressively anyway. Um, and so I found myself in a lot of melee matchups going TP ignite and yeah. y y some champions just aren't really, um, tied. Like I think echo is another one of them. Some of these champions of the game, they're not overly tied to their flash. Like I'm actually not against double combat summoners. If you're very disciplined in the way you, you know, in terms of your jungle threat assessment, you know mm -hmm. how to survive ganks. And you have a plan to actually utilize it. So, for example, I can imagine with a champ like Shen. Now, I'm not saying Flash is not valuable, right? Flash would definitely be valuable for getting onto key targets with, like, you know, E Flash. But at the same time, you know, if you can get a lot done with your healing night in the early game and get a lead and get pressure and get shit done, it's not like you need Flash to impact the game because you're already in such a commanding position, right? Yeah. So I, I, I uh, would think it's some. You can let the replay just play out. I think, don't think there's. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think like, yeah. into range matchups, it might be a little bit tricky, but into melee matchups, I think I could see it being quite good. 
I mean, I'm taking it into range match of mid lane with Face Rush and Nimbus Cloak. So the way I see it, uh, I think we're gonna dive, but I don't think it results in anything. So th I, by the way, the, I want to like get Empowered Q before I attack her. And I didn't get Empowered Q, so I don't take the Tower Agra. But I know that uh, my damage, like my lethal damage is uh, required, or it's kind of constrained by the fact that I have to get the Empowered Q there. So drag the blade through the enemy. But yeah, I was saying that uh, like heal ignite is like, uh, most of the time when I'm using flash, it is just to get that like, critical extra bit of movement to get uh, either into range for an ability or out of range of an ability. So usually when you're chasing somebody and they're low HP, the flash that the distance it covers is like, is like overkill. You don't actually mm -hmm. need to cover that much distance. So when you're running heal, it's going to give you a little bit of a movement speed boost. And if you're running Nimbus Cloak on top of that, it's going to give you more movement speed. And it's just going to like, it's enough like you can prompt the opponent's flash by healing yourself. Mm. And since heal also gives value by itself because it's healing your HP mm. and I'm using my HP as a resource all the time. Like you see, I, I'm using my flash in this lane to con kind of conserve uh, HP. So it's a resource for me. So if I can get more of that resource by using the ability and at the same time blow the opponent's longer uh, cooldown summoner spell, it's worth for me. And in the 2v2 mid lane, because mid lane is... Uh, in some sense, very centric, and there is much more opportunities for 2v2s in mid lane than there is in top lane. So when I'm using heal in a 2v2, we are so much stronger. Yeah, like, it's a 2v2 summoner. Because both of our champions get movement speed and heal. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and look, everything you've said there, what I typically say is that at the end of the day, you know, it's the same for runes, build, summoners, whatever. As long as you understand what the trade-offs are, you understand the positives yeah. and negatives of your setup, then that's completely fine because you just because then you can cater your gameplay towards what the strengths mm. of the setup are. Okay, so sorry, we're going back to this gameplay because now we're actually hitting six. So this yeah. is where Shen starts to get a bit spicy, right? So we take some great trades here. Um... And we're going to see your infamous F keys in action. Yeah, honestly, I, I've been a little bit lazy with them, especially on stream, because I don't think it provides the best possible content if I'm like going full uh, faker mode. <laughs> no, I'm not watching like, watch full faker mode. <laughs> okay, okay, well, this is like lazy for me still, but I, I think it's really important to just know what your lane states are. And on Shen, it's turbo important. So what are you looking for when you pan your camera? What are you looking for? Like, what variables? Uh, I want to see, basically, the way the champions are posturing. So you can tell a lot from HP bars, but we can see those HP bars on top of the minimap. But what you can't see is uh, how the wave state looks. So is the wave going to crash? And you can't see how, oh, by the way, we're going to have a lot of Philosticks ganks in this game. Like, <laughs> I was going kind of uh, boom on stream because uh, we were having this battle versus the fiddlesticks that he, he had just has some kind of agenda versus me. So I end up just dying here. I don't think, like, okay, I have a ward, so maybe I could have warded. But with Camille being level six, me not having flash, okay, the town just kind of seals my face here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Dude, I, dude, if I'm playing against Expetsu, I just know he's gonna in every opportunity. I'm just gonna, get, I'm just gonna farm gold off Expetsu, honestly. I mean, yeah, when you look at this in hindsight, it probably wasn't the best, the yeah. best E. Yeah, but it's okay. Like uh, I make mistakes a lot. Yeah, uh, but I think it's it's just a matter of like trying to be more consistent, making better plays, and trying to learn from these mistakes if you can, ideally. But oh, not always. Sometimes you just we just have to take the L. <laughs> yep. So what were we saying before? Oh, yeah. So the state of the wave. HP bars. HP bars. Yeah, and the posture. So so it's like, how is the Lucian moving, for example? So if the Lucian is playing really aggressively, I know that there will probably be opportunities for ultimate soon. Mm. So then I will uh, increase the frequency at, at which I check the lane. But if I look mid lane and my LeBlanc is sitting back, only last hitting. I know that, okay, she's not using W on the wave. So she's always going to have W escape. So there's probably not going to be that many opportunities. So I'm going to kind of decrease the frequency at which I look mid lane and increase. This was personal, by the way, the E flash on the fiddle. It was just, I, I saw him. And the moment I saw him, I'm like, okay, this guy, I, I probably said piece of shit on stream. Like, <laughs> so, <laughs> I was just mad at him. This is some emotional League of Legends <laughs> gameplay. Jeez. <laughs> 
Guys, this is how to play Shen. Be emotional. This is how to be personal. <laughs> against your jungler, the enemy yeah. jungler. It's a battle. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it. I don't think it's good. I, I would advise more to be like this stoic philosopher. Just look at things objectively and don't let your emotions guide you. But today, th in this game, it was personal. <laughs> it was personal. <laughs> so, in terms of like mindset wise, now, like as a Shen, are you thinking, like, do you feel pressured to make something happen, or do you you're confident just sitting here farming and kind of scaling into mid game, or like? Like, how are you viewing? Because, again, I don't really understand Shen, like, in terms of, <laughs> is he a scaler? Does he, does he, do you feel no, pressure? No, 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 okay, okay. So, I, I, I can touch on that. So, he's, like, he's very bad in the late game. Like, you will get outscaled by every single top laner in the game. <laughs> like, like, Pantheon's gonna outscale, okay, Pantheon's pretty good late game. But, like, it, it, I don't think there is any champion that you outscale, okay? So, you want to end the game as fast as possible. That is my idea. And if I'm sitting on an ultimate and I'm not using it, I feel like, okay, I'm probably missing opportunities. Mm. Sometimes it's okay if you're ahead, okay? So if the status quo is um, like something that you want to maintain, then it's okay to keep your ultimate and just save it for, for when, for example, Lucian is 3 and 1. So I would like to ideally protect Lucian's shutdown. So protecting shutdowns is like one way of doing it. And shedding help uh, is very... Uh, he's another challenger player on Shen. So he's very like... Um, focused on this mentality of like or oh, saving his ultimate for protecting shutdowns. On the other hand, if the status quo is like not good, so if the game seems to be in and going in a way where okay, probably we're gonna lose if it continues like this, then I think sitting on ultimate is bad and I want to use it constantly. And usually I'm running ultimate hunter like most of the time. Mm. For this game, uh, I just wanted to switch it up a little bit and go for the fighter playstyle with last stand and triumph. And I think ideally I would have actually gone probably TP Ignite this game. But this is only due to the fact that TP got buffed recently. So previously, before TP got buffed, it was not good. There, because I was fighting Camille, uh, I did not check mid lane. And it ended up not being beneficial, or it ended up not being like a bad thing because I would not have ulted mid lane anyways, because uh, it would have not saved LeBlanc. But I still consider that a mistake on my part because. Uh, like the other five times out of ten, when that situation in mid lane actually can be turned around by a ultimate, I would have not seen it. So right now I'm thinking, okay, I made a mistake that I have to look more on the map. Mm. Yeah, no, it's really interesting because I always, yeah, I, I, I like the way you're talking though about, you know, thinking about, okay, is this a game where I need to be protecting and playing being conservative and somewhat reactive? And is this a game where I need to be proactive? And I think just before we get into this, I just want to talk about one mm. concept that's always been on my mind and because i've played uh was a big tf player do you ever yeah, yeah. think about kind of the threat of the ultimate itself like like holding it holding it kind of yeah. having it available as a concept yeah 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 it is it is one of the most important things on shen uh or like this is just a factor that you have to understand is that you're applying a global debuff on opponents. Mm. So this is one of the thing, things why I think like I'm kind of elo inflated in some sense, uh, because like my champion makes the opponents play worse. Okay. So in low elo, it's not as noticeable because people don't ask, actually like respect um, the ultimate. But in high elo, the enemy bot lane is gonna think, oh, they have Shen ultimate, and there's gonna be like so many opportunities for them where they're gonna think okay, I can't go in because they have Shen ultimate. So so you're just like, by existing, you're already applying Just by picking the everywhere. champ, you're so already giving your team a, a massive, massive benefit. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. The and, camera uh, oh, I, Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can come back to this later. Let's look at the play. Okay. So we get the triple taunt, uh, Ignite on Torel. And now I'm, I'm just like almost beating up my QQ because I want to kill the, kill the fiddlesticks as fast as possible. And I'm probably laughing on stream because we got a kill onto him. Very emotional, very emotional today. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know who you sound like, Expecto? I just realized you sound like, I don't know if you follow F1, but you sound like the Gunther, the guy from... Um... Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I watched Drive to Survive, so I know his interviews. Yeah, yeah he does like, like Gunther from, from the yeah. same. Is he, are you is he from the same country? <laughs> are you from, is Gunther from Finland as well? No, uh, he's um, from 
he speaks German, but he speaks with an accent, so I assume he is from Austria or um, Switzerland. Okay. Because uh, he speaks French too, but I think it's Austria, probably. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so we clean up, and then this is Shen 101, right? I mean, see an, mm. an opportunity on bot side, your bots. Now, but out of interest here, were you thinking that bot were like a win condition or, or in, a, in a good position, or were you just thinking in this game, oh, well, game's pretty even, I, I'm just going to use alt wherever if there's an opportunity? Because I think your illusion was three and one. Before this play, yeah, I'm, I'm very, I'm very focused on keeping bot lane alive because I saw that Lucian is ahead. Okay. So I know also that it's a target for the opponents. Yeah. So stuff's gonna happen, right? So, so like even if I'm not moving my screen over there, my eyes are on the minimap, looking up, looking at uh, Lucian and looking at Milio. But in general, I like, I keep my mind open to every opportunity that presents itself. All right, my question here for you, Expertu, this will probably be what a yeah. lot of Shen players will be asking here is, what happens if Camille didn't come to this play and is getting all the plates top? Do you panic? Do you care about that? What's your mindset when the laners don't TP like this? Um, yeah, this is this is difficult. So the thing is that uh, the tower platings were a pretty big nerf to Shen because it allows for so much gold uh, every time you ultimate. Um and I think one thing that you had to adapt uh, in terms of top lane Shen gameplay is like previously when you did this play, you would come back to lane and you would be stronger than the opponent, right? Because you got a lot of kills uh, and the opponent has just been farming top lane. But now it is the case that you take two kills in bottom lane, you probably get one kill, one assist, you come back with items, you're going to be one level down and 500 gold down on the opponent. So you just have to understand that, okay, I'm not going to beat this guy anymore. He has taken three tower platings. So we have to concede the 1v1. We're not even going to think about the 1v1, okay? So we have to play more on the map. But yeah, that's my idea when it comes to tower platings. And tower plates got also um, buffed, didn't they? In terms of like, I mean, they're, they're harder to kill, I think, on the recent Yeah, patch. so it, that's, that's an indirect buff to Shen. Yeah, yeah. So this is sort of a bit of a rare situation then where you have an item advantage. I think you're stronger than the Camille right now. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, let me see the tab. Yeah, okay, he yeah. doesn't so, have Sunbrow. So after he gets... He's probably going Trinity Force, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. So after the Mythic, he's probably going to be stronger than me. If he goes Divine Sunderer, like, for example, versus Jax. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. I don't want to... Oh, he... Oh, he... Oh, he... Uh, yeah, uh, we'll I'm, pretend yeah, we didn't see anything. It. Don't worry, so, I too. That's unfortunate. But you can see, uh, if we go back on this play, I want to just highlight the yeah. fact that I'm using my flash before my E. So right here, um, when I know that, yeah, yeah, this could just let it play out here. So I'm like thinking, okay, I'm pretty strong right now. I can fight this guy. So I will actually commit my flash in order to try to get the empowered Q. But I miss it here because the Camille was faster because uh -huh. of the uh nimble movement speed from the uh, item uh so i don't know what it's called but the gear what is it the 1100 gold item the spatula thing wait what do you mean yeah the spatula the spatula that comes i call it the spatula <laughs> <laughs> what are you yeah. talking about the, the triforce so you build triforce it looks like the spatula triforce component Spatula? I've never heard that. <laughs> it's a, a spatula. Yeah, yeah, it looks like a spatula. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so that item gives you movement speed. So I was, I didn't calculate the fact that he has the movement speed to get out. But I, w I was like, I would have committed my flash before uh, my E there. My E is coming off cooldown in two Wait, seconds, what the and I'm not uh, kind of afraid to use my flash very aggressively. I will use my flash just to get the opponent summoner spell. I will use my flash to get the opponent out of lane because I think it's just good usage of the mm. summoner spell. So, so yeah, I, I see what you mean, and, and you know, part of this, and again, I, I don't want to, I don't want this to be like a whole okay. Experto uses flash like a like a madman. I better do the same. I think it's more. Mm. You, this is the way you interpret your way of playing Shen, and and again, mm. it works for you because again, you're doing it with intention. You're doing it for lane control, and you're actually you know your limits, so you know what like what you're gonna get for it. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, exactly. It's it's always, calculated. always calculating like what is the kind of expected value that I will receive from yeah. using this ability. So if that uh, expected value is high, I will take it, even though it seems like the opportunity is not like a traditional flash opportunity, right? I don't care about that. I only care about, okay, what do I get out of it? Mm. And if it's positive and it's uh, like worth the cooldown, yeah, I'm doing it. 
So were you talking about the Hearthstone axe? Is that what you're yeah, talking about? The, spatula. Yeah, the oh, spatula. The axe. Yeah, 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 yeah. This item here. The spatula. Yeah, the, spatula. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the axe. Yeah, I was like, what the fuck? What the spatula? It doesn't, it doesn't even look like a spatula to me. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, so now we have ult back up. We have Ignite back up. We're in a pretty commanding position. I mean, when you have games like this, where you're playing a champ like Shen and you have a fed, fed AD carry, I mean, this is, you know, this is um, Shen's dream, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Ideal Shen game. I Actually, ideal Shen game would be versus Orn or something. Fiddlesticks coming out of nowhere. Me yelling on on stream right now that I hate Fiddlesticks. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, that's like whatever. Honestly, even if you die here, it literally doesn't change the game at all, right? No, 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 no. no. But it's personal. I don't care about winning. I care about like winning the battle versus Fiddlesticks. <laughs> All right. yeah, this is not like representative of the way I approach the game when I'm only focused on improving and climbing. But when I'm focused, okay, when I'm kind of like, there are two, I have kind of two modes. So one mode is like trying to get the maximal fun out. And then there is one mode of trying to get the maximal fun out by winning every single game. And right now I'm more in the fun mode, which will be reflected in my build soon. But um, yeah, I mean, what you said about ideal game, it, it's pretty much true. Uh, but also, I like to be strong. Like, I like to be capable of 1v1s. Mm. It just doesn't happen that often because literally no one plays tanks except Kasante mm. um, in high elo anymore. So the glory days of, like, Shen 1v1 potential are kind of over. So so on that, you know, you are talking about before, like, off-meta. Like, off sorry, off-meta yeah. builds and, you know, innovating builds. I know you're big on innovating builds with your Shen. Yes. So, you know, I saw a while ago you made a video on, on like kind of theory crafting and innovating builds. Do you want to kind of share your philosophy on innovating builds and setups? Yeah. So, hmm, I wonder how I should approach this, but like, oh no. And that was the Avengers call signal. <laughs> Avengers assemble. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really, so, so what, the way I approach off meta builds is like, um, I think it's just cool, right? Like if you can win and at the same time you're buying an item that no one expects you to buy, uh, that's like that's like the biggest dopamine spike I can get. So so what I love is I'm building, let's say I'm building Navori quick plates on Shen and I get a double kill and then my teammates realize I have Navori quick plates and then they start pinging my Navori quick plates. That's the biggest like moment of satisfaction that I can get, right? So I just want to find these kind of unique builds, unique playstyles that can function around that. And the way you do that is by literally just, I, I, I spent so much time on the league wiki, like way too much time. Like I, I, yesterday I had quit playing, I had stopped the stream and I was just an hour browsing champions and browsing items on league wiki because I was thinking, okay, I really like static shiv what is the best champion I can use Static Shiv on? And I was going through the list one by one. By one and I was thinking, okay, uh, Thresh has high AP ratio, so also has AD ratio on E. Okay, this is potential, potential right here. So I will write it down. Then I will test it. So uh, it, there's one thing is like theory crafting, but the second thing is like putting it to the test, right? So you want to have some kind of hypothesis every time you're going into game to test it. Right here, very important to ult on Lucian, by the way, to keep him alive. And then we get to clean up the game uh, or the team fight. Hmm. So let's take a look at this. Yeah, so, I yeah. mean, Lucian, the win condition. Yeah. Beautiful taunt. I mean, they have really no other option here. I mean, if they go on you and they spend their fiddle ult and resources on you, they're going to lose the game anyway. So they kind of have to go on to Lucian yeah. there. So you're just kind of waiting for that. So, so, so back to the, to the, to the um thing. So, so you actively, so it's kind of more for you, not because you think it's, it's just, again, a pure hobby. It's like, again, for you, you find it very satisfying to try different builds. Mm. And so it's kind of like, yeah, just something that you enjoy. So it's it's not really something you feel as though is important for climbing per se. It's more just like a hobby, right? Or a yeah, passion. yeah, it, it, it's, it's fun for me. But then sometimes the innovation that seems like just fun at the beginning turns into LP printing machine. Uh, so... By the way, I, I almost escaped here, but uh, they, Camilla has like three flashes on her kit, so couldn't escape. But I took a lot of time out of them. So right there, like the play initially was not very good. I just got caught. That's the bow special. I wasted like 20 seconds of their time, so it was fine. 
Uh, but yeah, what I wanted to say is there are like examples in the past where I have just thought, okay, well, this might be something fun to test out. And I keep thinking, okay, there's potential here. And one of them was that I started building support items on Shen uh, in 2021. Uh, so I started building Redemption and I started building um, Mikhail's and these sort of items because I kept thinking that they're way too cheap for their effect, right? And Chen synergizes with uh, healing and shielding power because of his Q uh, or his passive shield, which is normally activated by his Q uh, and uh, his ultimate, which is shielding allies. So you can make use of that kind of supportive power. And since the items are cheaper because they're balanced up around support uh, champions, they function really well on a champion that is like getting access to income, but also not too much income. Right, because you're like uh, having to give up waves for ulting and all this sort of stuff. So if you try to build just tank items, normally uh, you will kind of fall behind because you don't have as much income as everyone else. But you're kind of cheating the game by buying support items. And since Shen also like actually synergizes really well with this playstyle of just peeling for your carries, the, like the ideal, you're not actually a tank. You're a warden, right? You, you're a kind of tank support that tries to protect your teammates. So it ended up being that uh, the initial build, which was just for fun, turned out into something that got me like uh, 1000 LP in four days when I came back to league. And I always find found it like much more fun to uh, grind when you have something new kind of in your arsenal. So you're kind of testing out something new. Like I could not play Shen for so many games as I have played if I did not mix up the items every now and then. Interesting. Hmm. So I guess that's kind of part of like, I guess being a one trick, I mean, a part of it for you is what keeps it interesting is the, yeah, the, the yeah, this whole theory crafting thing. I do feel as though it's a bit of a double-edged sword, right? Cause I've, I've, I've kind of seen people kind of go down that rabbit hole of getting obsessed about trying all these builds and shit. And then they forget, you know, that they're making all these basic mistakes that, you know, not even tied to the yeah. itemization, right? Yeah. So, it, you know, I can say it's a bit of a double-edged sword, right? So, yeah, I, I see what you mean. The I'm narrative sure. is that if, like, if I, I if I just find was, a new build, yeah, like, that will give me LP. It's like, yeah. I, I need, like, the build's going to give me the LP yeah. versus the actual fundamentals. But the thing with Expert is he's fundamentally a great Shen player. So, whatever build he's going to, it's not, he's not compensating for a weakness per se, you know? Would you agree with yeah. that, Expert? So, or? I agree with that. And I think it was Zukil who said this very well. So, I think Zukil is amazingly talented player and very like good uh, mechanically. Uh, and he was being asked on stream, like, what are the best Yone builds? What, what is the best Yone rune page? And he said what he thinks is good. And then he said, but also runes don't matter that much at the end of the day. Like you could play, I could play freaking, I don't know, Glacial Augment Shen. Okay, that's not even bad. I could play Eri Shen and easily hit Challenger still. And it's not the best rune page, but it's just, shows you that okay there is like this room for micro optimization but at the end of the day the effect of it is is limited right it's not going to fix your laning phase if you pick up this new build or these new rooms so i think the most important thing actually in terms of build wise is um finding something that works and sticking to it because it allows you to build up i mean muscle memory is one term people use but it's more like intuition and uh, like fast knowledge so i know that at this moment since i have a shield bash i have cheap shot i will do this amount of damage so that that allows me to go for a kill but if i keep switching my room page every single game i'm not going to have that intuition and knowledge of okay here at this moment level 13 i do this amount of damage yeah and and this is actually something i'm really passionate about like i think that there's something to be said about just owning like specializing in a specific style as well like you look at a lot like i remember yeah i think zukil he goes you know this 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 setup on yone top that i kind of disagreed with a while ago with yone where he would he would never go bork he would always just go the shield bro ie and never understood him like there were so many matchups where bork would be so much better but again i think his mindset is it's like it doesn't give a shit he's like well he knows bork ie that's like you know zeal bork ie whatever he's good at that that's what he's comfortable with and he owns that as part of his mm -hmm. identity you know like i think that there's something to be said about owning the the, the way you want to play um yeah. but it's it, it is interesting because again it's a double-edged sword it's simultaneously important runes and build are relevant but yeah. th again they're not going to compensate for your fundamentally poor decisions mm. um 
So anyway, getting back into this here, I was going to say, so Dragon was coming up here, and then you don't have ultimates. I'm assuming the decision here was like, well, this is Dragon Soul. I'm just going to group an ARAM. I don't, uh, yeah. you, you can't afford to be late to this play, right? And not the build, not the build. Static ship. <laughs> and this is the innovation here. This static I'm, ship. I'm serious about this, by the way. I, I keep, I'm trying to currently optimize how to build, uh, or what items to choose around this item. But I think, because it fixes Shen's inherent weakness, uh, which is wave clear, right? Mm. Even though the stat line is not good, but it fixes that weakness. Mm. So I'm trying to f figure out a way how to make this the best possible build. And I think there is some possible build that is like good. By the way, here I'm not like I'm not afraid to into a bush just because I think there is someone there. Like obviously, I, like 50% of the time I'm gonna miss like there, but then ooh, ooh, save the guy. Ooh, but yeah, like sometimes I take these plays that are kind of. Mm, I think the best way to uh, illustrate my point. I will do it afterwards. Let's see the play. Oh, you're going to get a lot of revenge here. <laughs> the BM. Yeah. The BM. The absolute BM. <laughs> oh, Fitter's going to get away now. some emotion behind this gameplay. <laughs> oh, no. You're holding the E. What the hell? You're going to die here, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I had to... Uh, Show him who's boss. So, so one thing that I do very often is when I'm walking, uh, like in the jungle, uh, and I think that there is like ten percent chance that someone is um, trying to catch me in the jungle. Like even if it's five percent chance, I will do these micro movements where I will like uh, move backwards when I'm crossing the bush, and it's gonna look weird because it's like okay, well, there's no one there. Like why are you dodging? But it's the cost of this. Um, like move. Oh no! <laughs> just ignore the flash. Um, but the, but the cost of just doing a little sidestep when crossing a bush is very low compared to the upside potential, which is um, like people are gonna think you're faker and the enemy team is gonna be completely demoralized because you just dodged their fog of war, Camille uh, or something like this. Does that make sense? So what you're saying is that your so what you're saying is that you you move in a particular way past the bush to try and bait out the ability, even though if it's inefficient for your, from a positioning perspective. Uh, Do you have an example? Yeah, Was there an like, example in this game? Like, okay, so so I, I I don't think I have one in this game, but let's mm -hmm. say I'm I'm in mid lane. Okay, I want to roam uh, uh, to bot lane, and mm -hmm. I take a dangerous path through the enemy jungle, and I have a feeling that there's like twenty percent chance that enemy Elise is gonna be in a mm -hmm. bush. So then when I move. Uh, next to that bush, I'm going to act like there's going to be a cocoon coming from the bush. So I would think, okay, if Elise is in the bush and dodge now backwards to dodge the cocoon. Oh, I see what and you mean. Time, yeah. Yeah. Most of the time, there's not going to be an Elise. In but the it bush. would look silly but if they're not there. One out, yeah, one out of, yeah. One out of 10 times, there's going to be an Elise in the bush. I'm going to dodge the cocoon and it's going to be worth it for me. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. I see what you mean. It's like, it's like, it's like an extra layer of security kind of. Yeah. 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 And this is very uh, like important when you're clearing wards, for example, you never want to just stand still and clear a ward. You want to move between mm. every auto attack mm. and you want to move unpredictably mm. because there is always the chance that someone's going to throw out a skill shot at you when you're clearing a ward. Uh, so you just want to make it more difficult for the opponents in that case, even though in most of the cases you're not going to hit, get hit by anything. Mm. And so this is the build that you were testing this game, the static shift into Abyssal Mask. I mean, versing double yes. double AP mid-jungle there, a lot of value. Yes. I think Abyssal Mask is underrated right now. Yeah, I think it's a it's a solid... It, it, it did receive a bit of a nerf, didn't it? Or did it not? I, I mean, it was changed uh, in the item changes so that it no longer has the mana and mm. all this sort of stuff. But for Shen, that's only a buff because now we can actually build it, mm. right? So right now, what is important about the item is the fact that it, the magic damage uh, or the magic resist reduction has a max HP ratio or bonus HP ratio. So you can actually reach it's capped at 25 uh, magic resist reduction. Mm. And this is like you're giving your mid laner Sork boots times one and a half, right? So everything that you can do as Shen 
to kind of enable your team is usually worth it. So that's why I'm picking it up right now. And now this game looks relatively straightforward from here. I mean, we're in a very commanding yeah. position. Um, any any tips for Baron? Like, do you is it just really simple? You just always want to be in a side lane with Baron and then just look for an alt. Do you ever uh, want to group up with your team? Lane. If you have ultimate ready, yeah. Uh, there are some situations where enemies have so much burst that you want to actually group up with your team. Here I tried to kill the Ash with static ship, but I didn't get the proc on her. Um, but um, yeah, there are some situations where you just want to immediately group and use your ultimate like after the team fight has already started. So you want to be there for sure. Uh, most of the time you're going to probably side lane. But this is something that is kind of difficult because Shen doesn't actually achieve much in the side lane because he does not have tower damage and he does not have wave clear, uh, except maybe with these specific builds. What I've noticed about top lane is that like a lot of the champions or just top lane as a role in general is like you have to, there's so much matchup, like in-depth matchup understanding, like a huge part of top is matchup understanding. Like there's a mm. lot of similarities what I was thinking here as, as watching this, I was thinking to myself, well, the foundation of the champion of Shen, it has a pretty clear identity. Now, it doesn't mean that there's not much complexity because there's many ways you can utilize your kit, right? That, like we mentioned with the R uses and stuff. But again, most of the complexity with top lane champs are in like the the intricacies of the trading patterns and the intricacies of so many matchups. Like that's what always overwhelms me about top lane as a role is that like there's so many intricate, small, little trading patterns. And I feel like in a way, maybe you're right. You know, early on you were saying how in mid, a lot of the mages, the trading patterns are relatively similar. Whereas in top, maybe maybe you're right in this in the sense that like, especially because you're a melee versus melee, there are so many ways the trades can pan out. Like I always get overwhelmed looking, okay, we got Shen into Camille, and then you got Shen into Jack, Shen into Aurelia, <laughs> Shen into Fiora. It's like, like, I feel like each and every one of these champions, like the, the trading patterns are so, you know, intense in a way. And like, I view top lane yeah. now watching your game plan, watching like the doing the Bio Panther episode, it's kind of like, okay, do we understand our champ's identity? Yes, tick. Okay, do we know the matchups? Tick. And then it's kind of like, once you've got like the, those two, the matchups, and then like the basic champ identity understanding, then it just comes down to playing the game of League of Legends into the mid game and the macro. So yeah, I feel like there's a lot of, again, a huge part of top lane is just that early lane and matchup understanding. Would you agree that and, like for uh, you with when you- I, I agree with this. And I think, I think top lane matchups are actually- in some sense, like more important than mid lane matchups, for example. It's like more punishing as a lane, right? right? If you mess late. up a wave. Uh, because I think in top lane, the, the lane is so punishing due to its isolated nature uh, and the fact that it's a long lane. Because if you make a mistake versus a Darius, it literally means you don't get to play the game for 15 minutes. Like, that and that forces you to take this matchup seriously, and it's like every every champion in top lane has these like different mini games and different windows of opportunity. So in order to play that role, you need to really understand it, and that that's one of the reasons why I think like again, champion mastery is so important because the amount of combinations that you can take. So so let's say you have forty top laners, possible top laners, and you do forty choose two. There's a lot of combinations right there. Um, but if you have only uh, one champion that you always play, you only have 40 possible matchups. But if you play 10 champions, then the amount of matchups is already so much more, right? It's 10 times more. So it's like so difficult to learn all the intricacies of every matchup if you don't get to play every matchup. Because if you're only playing uh, one champion, you get to see Jack's matchup like many times. But if you're switching the champion, you don't get to play the same matchup uh, in a like a certain amount of time at all. So then you don't actually learn the matchup by heart. Yes, yeah, spot on. Was there anything, any other comments about this game, Nathan, from you or no? No, I think this was. Uh, and, uh, I'm I, just. I'm just. May I soul stealer? May I soul stealer? Why does he have may I soul stealer? Who has magis? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Oh, Jesus Christ. He's just trying to make it personal to the fiddle. 
expected to psychopath yeah. with these builds. I, I'm the opposite of builds. I, I will literally just see Basic. a build as cookie cutter. I'm going to that build. I care about my decision making. But, uh, and, uh, you know, one thing, again, I think this is where personality types come into play. Some people love right. builds. And I can tell that you're really into, like, the build theory and understanding, the like, kind of the math behind it or how the, how the stats work. And then other people... So Don't boring to me. Shit. I've never actually been on the league wiki and read something on there. No, you bullshit. No, I haven't. That's <laughs> unbelievable. Actually, I think I've looked at gold amounts for items. That's all I've so done. So you haven't looked at a wiki and actually read the kit? Never. What? <laughs> that is insane to me. Yeah, just I just will play against it. And what? I'm a jungler, dude. I just gank shit. <laughs> I do that all the time. Yeah, like, no, on I don't. a daily basis. I'll really? Go on the wiki. Like, like oh, not wow. daily, but I'll say at least once every two or three days. I'll go on the wiki and I'll read a kit to like really understand how it works, like at it, like properly. Fascinating. Yeah, I, I I wrote I wrote my own local website that scrapes the data from League Wiki so that I every time there's a new patch, I can immediately calculate the gold values of every item oh because I'm looking at opportunities to kind of... Uh, also, Freak's uh, patch rundowns are really uh, good because the Freak goes into the numbers like between uh, every item and every change. And I just like... I spend so much time just wow. thinking about uh, like potential opportunities for items and just understanding the trade-offs that you're making because inherently it is a matter of like... Okay, this item does this, and this item does this. Usually, there is no like clear like uh, kind of domination relationship. So there is not just one item that is better at every single thing than the other item. Sometimes there are those, but then usually it's just a matter of understanding. Okay, well, if I build static shiv, I will have wave clear, yes, but I'm lacking ability haste for ultimates, and I'm lacking tankiness. So how do I kind of synergize it with that and build up the weaknesses that are created from purchasing this item mm. and then all of this sort of stuff? But it's yeah, I, I spend a lot of time just looking at the numbers. I guess that goes into you know your maths and stuff like that. You're just that yeah. type of guy, right? That type yeah, of guy. yeah. <laughs> that's what all ties in. All right. Well, yeah. I mean, just as watching this, I was just thinking about when I boot camp in Europe one day. I know how yeah. to play against X Betu now. So <laughs> we're going to be five men in level one in the top bush. We're going to be stack stack top bush five stack. Yeah. <clears throat> um but anyway with the re- so i mean well i think there's a lot lot of insightful stuff here today i mean and thank you for taking the time to come on the show no and, problem um, this was really fun no i really appreciate it. we really appreciate it and um if, if there's socials that you want us to plug in we'll put them below in the description we'll have you tagged on the youtube yeah. title anyway expect your youtube, YouTube channel. channel twitch yeah. twitter etc i mean it's x it's x everywhere except Discord, freaking Discord username change, man. Somebody took... Oh, someone stole it. Yeah, you have to go quick. Yeah, no one stole mine, eh? Yeah. <laughs> GG. Well, um, any, yeah, any parting words? On Twitter, Axpeto on Twitch, Axpeto on YouTube, and uh, Axpeto on Metafy if you want coaching. It's really expensive, though, so don't do it if you're uh, in a financial situation, <laughs> which does not support buying uh, esports coaching. <laughs> As I said, that's, this is a responsible financial podcast. That's what this is. Compound interest. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, yeah, thank you again. And we'll uh, see you guys next week for another episode. Cheers. That was great, man. Thank you so much. That was really, really awesome. I think it was some great discussion there. And um, we'll... uh,